Chapter 11. A Toad-Like Woman Axel couldn't understand the meaning of the system's words. There were no records of the girl in this world, and further information was locked. What the hell does that mean? he asked. It means that the system can't give you any information on her at the moment. The system, like Akashic Records, is bound by the laws of the world. The entity AR has managed to secure a business relationship between us. Thus, many things cannot be given to you unless you have the required approval rate, or unless one of us pays a penalty or completes a task of equivalent difficulty. Axel nodded slowly. Is that why you can't provide the information on ways to cure me? Affirmative. Axel gave the purple-haired girl another look. Who the hell was she that this world doesn't even have records on her, and the information on her is locked? Well, whatever. Not his business. Delicious free food is the priority right now. Hmm. Can he take some back to his room? After the feast, Dumbledore stood up once again. Now that you have been fed and watered, I have a few start-of-term announcements to make. The staff remains the same, except for the Defense Against Dark Arts. It will be taken by Professor Dolores Umbridge, who's shown remarkable mastery of the subject in her interview. Let us all welcome her. Axel saw that it was a woman in pink whose looks matched fairly well with a toad's. The students seemed to have never heard of her, so they just gave her a polite applause, to which the woman gave a sickly sweet smile that made Axel cringe. And... Hem hem. Dumbledore was going to make further announcements, but he stopped since Dolores Umbridge had stood up for some reason after clearing her throat. Pardon me, Headmaster, but I'd like to say a few words to the children on this occasion, she said in a high-pitched voice that grated on Axel's nerves. Of course, of course. You're most welcome, Professor Umbridge, said Dumbledore magnanimously. Hello, my children. As the headmaster said, I'm going to be your defense against the dark arts teacher from this year. But that is not my main aim of coming here, she said and paused for the dramatic effect. I'm here to teach you things that'll change your life and can change the world. I want to find capable children who are willing to be enlightened. So let us all get along, ha, hey, she said, and let out a high-pitched fake laugh in the end before sitting down. There was a lukewarm applause for her, since most students didn't seem to share her passion. Though among the students, someone was much more reactive than everyone. It was Martina Valentino. She was looking at Umbridge with a frown, as if she was surprised and disgusted by her presence. After the applause, Dumbledore went on, Thank you, Professor Umbridge, for your kind words. Now, I have an important announcement to make. I must tell you that this year, the third floor corridor is a prohibited area, Students are not allowed to enter unless they want to die a painful death. That got Axel's attention. He was now feeling somewhat curious about what was inside. The old man shouldn't have left it like a cliffhanger. Dumbledore made a few more announcements before it was time for the feast to end. And now, before we go to bed, let us sing the school song, he said enthusiastically, and Axel, who was rather tired and sleepy, suddenly jerked his head up. What did he say? he thought, hoping it was not another song from the hat. But alas, it turned out to be something worse. Everyone pick their favorite tune, said Dumbledore, and off we go. And the school bellowed, Hogwarts, Hogwarts, Hoggy Warty Hogwarts, teach us something, please. This thing made sorting hats loud and annoying sound tame in comparison. It seems he'll have to keep a set of earplugs during his stay here. Damn it, a warning would have been helpful, he thought as he pulled his hands off his ears, which he'd covered in annoyance. Now that the feast was finally over, the first year Slytherins follow, wed their prefect into the dungeons where the Slytherin dorms were located. While the other firsties had no idea where they were going, Axel made sure to memorize all the paths carefully. They all stopped in front of a bare stretch of stone wall in the dungeons of Hogwarts Castle. This is the entrance to the Slytherin common room, said the prefect. You need a password to enter. Preservation. When he said the word, the wall parted with a low rumbling to show the Slytherin common room. The common room was a dungeon-like room with greenish lamps and chairs. This dungeon extended part way under the lake, giving the light in the room a green tinge. The common room had lots of low-backed black and dark green button-tufted leather sofas skulls and dark wood cupboards. 
The walls were decorated with tapestries that featured wizards wearing Slytherin robes. Even though it had quite a grand atmosphere, Axel felt quite out of place here. Currently, the huge common room was dimly lit with the many crystal balls levitating in midair, and it was filled with students. A tall, blonde-haired boy stepped out of the crowd. He had the head boy badge on his chest, indicating his position. Performing a noble courtesy, he addressed everyone. Welcome and welcome back, everyone. To those who don't know me, I am Alaric Malcolm, the head boy of Hogwarts, he said, his voice having a slight Russian accent. Most of you already know, but just for the information, I'm a pureblood from a pureblood family. The Malcolm family is an influential family of Russia. We branched out to Britain seven years ago. He then swept his gazes over the first years. Before everyone goes to their dorms, I need to make some things clear, especially with our new members, he said, as he relaxed back into an armchair. One, he said, raising his finger, as everyone must have heard from many sources, anything that happens in Slytherin stays in Slytherin. We will always present a strong and united front. Second, Slytherin House has been winning the House Cup for the past seven years, and I intend to continue that. So, you all would do well to gain points, and if not, then at least try not to lose them. Professor Snape will handle the rest, he said, adding the last part with a slight smirk. Third, and the most important one, he said, sitting up straight. As everyone is already aware, Britain has observed many changes in the past years, he said, taking out a mirror-like object that Andromeda also had used to emphasize the point. While some changes are welcome, some are not. The mudbloods, who now call themselves newbloods, have now started thinking themselves equal to us purebloods. They are demanding equal rights, the audacity. Many sneered at that, agreeing wholeheartedly with Alaric. No, he said, shaking his head. The Malcolm family came to Britain, thinking of it as a land of opportunities and old heritage, but it's turning into a festering ground of mudbloods. So, Everyone should do well to not lose to mudbloods and remind them of their place from time to time. Many people began voicing their agreement on the last one, some sporting cruel smiles like the bulky-looking crooked teeth dude standing behind Malcolm like a bodyguard. Axel, on the other hand, was worried about his blood status. What the hell is he supposed to do here? It seems like there's no muggle born in here. Malcolm raised his hand to silence everyone. So now that we're done with the basics, let's get an intro of our new members. The name, blood status, and your family background. Just like how I introduced myself in the beginning. Make sure not to lie, since whatever you say can be confirmed easily. And it would be better if you didn't hide your background, since your background will decide your treatment and standing in the house. Hearing the words, Axel felt a sinking feeling all of a sudden. He had planned to remain low-key, and not reveal his family background to anyone. Even Andromeda, Rose, and the others didn't know that he grew up in the Muggle world and was most probably a Muggle-born. When Andromeda had asked him, he had just said that he didn't want to call anyone he knew and that he didn't have parents. They just thought that his parents were dead. But like Rose and Susan, he had been raised by a wizarding family. How else would he have the knowledge to come to the St. Mungo's by himself, along with the other basic knowledge, if he was raised by muggles? But what was he supposed to do now, that everyone has to reveal their blood status and family background? He was a guy who didn't even know his full name until an hour ago. And now, he's supposed to tell his family background and blood status? He sighed in exasperation. Actually, Axel's plan wasn't too bad. Usually, the first-year Slytherins don't have to introduce themselves. But this year, the first year, Slytherins have at least five to six prominent pureblood family heirs that everyone knows about. And many other influential pureblood families from other countries or magical communities have also migrated to Britain or just sent their children to Hogwarts. Thus, Alaric Malcolm just wants to build connections with these kids so that they'll be helpful to him in the future. Axel just happened to be unlucky enough to suffer from the collateral damage. System, can I lie about my family? Will they find out? It's not recommended, Axel. The mirror in his hand is a device with which he can access information about most of the pure blood families. Axel was surprised. Really? What the heck is that device? 
Everyone seems to have it, he asked curiously. Even Rose and the others each had one, and they had spent most of the time of their train ride together playing something with it, and he'd seen it being sold in many shops. It's called a Magi Mirror. It is a device that has been complexly enchanted to perform a multitude of tasks. The wizards have made their own version of the internet, which they call the Magi Hive. Anyone can search the information you provide through the Magi Hive using that device. Axel shook his head. He shouldn't get sidetracked. Currently, the main question is, what the fuck is he supposed to do right now? Upon being asked for an introduction, the arrogant blondie from earlier pompously strutted forward. I am Draco Malfoy. I'm a pure blood with direct relation with the Black family. And the Malfoy family is a rich and influential pure blood family, he announced proudly. While some were impressed, Axel only felt disdain at how these people were being all proud and arrogant at having something they never had to work for. After listening to the very unreasonable words the Malcolm guy said, and observing the attitude of these people, a deep sense of disdain and contempt had developed in his mind. He doesn't want to be a part of this house. While the others were introducing themselves, he quietly slipped out of the first years and mixed in among the other Slytherins. With the skills he'd picked up, this much was easy to him, even when he was a cripple. There were about 50 students that were sorted into Slytherin this year. No one paid attention when he didn't introduce himself. After the introductions were over and when the first years were being taken to their dorms, Axel joined the others, though he still made sure to keep his presence low. Unfortunately, someone did actually see him. Hey, Axel, where did you vanish during the introductions? Came a girl's annoying voice. Pausing in his steps, he ground his teeth to suppress the urge to punch whoever had asked that. It turned out to be the pansy girl, and when she had asked that, several people also heard it. Unfortunately, that Malfoy boy had also heard it. Yeah, you didn't introduce yourself, he exclaimed. Why did you not do it? Are you a half-blood? A Weasley? Don't tell me you're a mudblood? Draco Malfoy didn't really care whether he was Weasley or a mudblood. He was just jealous that Axel's appearance and temperament were much more attention-grabbing than his. Axel frowned. He'd not said a word to this guy up to now. But the guy was repeatedly attacking him for no apparent reason at all. Axel was not a monk and his patience was not infinite. You should ask that to your mother, Blondie, he said blandly. Gasp! Many people around them heard his reply, and some people like Pansy gasped while some sniggered. Axel didn't pay attention to any of them as he moved on. In Slytherin, everyone had a room for themselves, and when they were sorted, their luggage had been transported to their rooms by the house elves. Axel walked along the doors and quickly found a door with his name written on it. Malfoy, who was too stunned to speak for a few moments, finally came to his senses. You, you mudblood! I'm sure you don't have any family background. You think you can get away with this? But Axel was not in any mood to listen to his threats. He entered his room and shut the door behind him. He examined his room. It was a big room, mostly decorated in green and silver. There was a soft bed, a study table, a wardrobe, and some other miscellaneous furniture. He found his bag lying on the bed. It was the first time he was going to have a room of his own. He hadn't slept on a bed for three years, and the one at the orphanage was a bunk bed with springs sticking out of the mattress. Not a soft and comfortable one like this one. Too bad he was never going to be able to sleep on it. Yeah, when he was in the common room, he had already decided that he was not going to stay in this place. The people here were all bigoted idiots, and every second he stays here, he's going to be in more danger. He's already made one enemy in just a few hours, and he's not sure how many he'll make if he stays any longer. Currently, he's not in the right condition to fight in any way, be it physically, magically, or in terms of background. It's just fortunate that he at least has his wits about him. Otherwise, he'd have just decided to stay here and then humiliatingly gotten kicked out one day after being bullied one-sidedly. Why not leave on his own terms instead of leaving after suffering the inevitable suffering that was waiting for him here? The only regret was, I thought I'd at least get to sleep in the bed for one day before I left, he lamented while looking at the very inviting bed. But with the blondies and pansies' help, 
there's no guarantee that someone among these arrogant people won't come to disturb him at night. Due to magic, locks are useless. If anyone comes, he's not confident he can defend himself without killing or maiming anyone, and that'll just bring more trouble and enemies. He is not going to let anyone bully him. Thus, after an hour of wait, giving a last glance at the room, he left the Slytherin dorms for good with his backpack sling over his shoulders. An, as stated, no bullying. Let Axel teach you how to escape bullying without having to submit to anyone. Also, how did Umbridge get here? There's info on the mysterious girl in the next chapter. Vote with Power Stones. Let's climb high. If you want to consider supporting this piece of art and read ahead, join me at Patreon. We 70 subscribers already. Patreon.com slash Snollygoster edit. Damn, I know it's temporary, but we're on three. Chapter 12. The Encounter with the Mafia Prodigy. Martina Valentino, the beautiful girl with purple hair and violet soul-stealing eyes, walked through the halls of Hogwarts under a disillusionment charm. In her previous life, she was a genius, but also a shut-in geek with no social life to speak of. At the time when the worst pandemic struck her world in 2030, it made the previous one look quite tame in comparison. Scientists were unable to find any cure. Through some luck and a lot of hard work, she was somehow able to make a vaccine that could save millions of lives. But the capitalists of her country prohibited her from revealing the formula to anyone. Money and power were somehow the priority for them. With hundreds of thousands of people dying all over the world, she had argued with them to prioritize the lives of the people first. It was too late when she realized she shouldn't have done that. She found out that she was going to be silenced. She was already under strict monitoring to begin with. There was no escape. They had made these plans from the moment she had revealed her research to them. The last thing she did was leak the formula all over the internet. She couldn't even confirm whether she succeeded or not before she died. The next thing she knew, she met a god who said her actions had saved millions, and she was given a wish. Of course, she chose reincarnation in the Harry Potter world. The god had said some warnings like the world would be different and dangerous or to choose another wish, etc., but she hadn't paid any attention to that. She had just wanted to do magic and experience Hogwarts life. Only after being reincarnated did she realize what god had meant by different. This world was different for sure. So different that there was no Harry Potter in this world. No, seriously. WTF. After overcoming her surprise, she realized that her starting conditions were excellent, and she even had a few cheats or golden fingers characteristic to reincarnators. Thus, she decided to live her life to the fullest with magic. She was reborn in a very wealthy and loving family, which mattered a lot to someone like her, who was an orphan previously. After rebirth, she finally got a chance to enjoy her childhood and also got to experiment with magic. She made a few things for her family business, too, so that they stopped focusing so much on their more violent businesses. Her school was, of course, going to be Hogwarts. Where else would she choose? She wanted to meet all the characters. Her favorite character was Hermione, since she could relate to her a lot. And she was heavily disappointed when the brilliant girl ended up with Ron in the seventh part. Today, in her third year at Hogwarts, she finally did meet Hermione, along with many other characters, but as expected, many things are different. Like, what the hell is that umbitch doing here? And Dumbledore said she was actually competent? Did that bitch learn magic in this world, or does she have a Voldemort sticking to her body? For heaven's sake, where is Voldemort's wraith in the first place? Quirrell is still teaching muggle studies with no turban and a head full of healthy hair. She thought in exasperation. Currently, she was once again walking through the corridors of Hogwarts after curfew, doing her routine exploring. She was in half the mood to go to the third floor corridor since clearing an obstacle course sounded quite fun. It was built for children anyways. She also wanted to pet Fluffy if he was still the first obstacle in this world. While walking under her invisibility, she almost got a jump scare when someone suddenly walked by her. What in the? She quickly turned around to investigate. She could barely make out the silhouette of a boy walking through the shadows. He had a hood on, covering his hair, and his face was covered too. 
He was just walking with a slight limp in each step and without any hiding spell cast on him, and yet she found herself losing sight of him from time to time. Martina couldn't understand, and whether her eyes were playing tricks on her or the boy had some kind of magic cast on himself. She turned around and decided to follow him since she had nothing to do anyway. She currently had one invisibility and one silencing charm on her, so she just casually walked while following him to see what this first year was up to. Just as they reached the corner, she saw him suddenly disappear. In the next moment, she heard sounds of footsteps as a Hufflepuff prefect soon emerged from the corner. When the prefect had walked far away, she saw something beside the suit of armor move, and his silhouette once again became visible. Martina also saw his amber-colored eyes which seemed to glow in the dark. He was using his cloak as a camouflage, she realized, and it was so well executed that he disappeared right before her eyes. Hey, wasn't that a ninja technique? She murmured to herself. Are all eleven years olds like this these days? As she followed him, she saw him suddenly pause for a moment, making her wonder if someone was coming again. But then, he broke into a run. What the hell? She thought as she quickly gave chase. It looked like he was struggling quite a lot as there was a limp in each of his steps, but he didn't stop and took a turn to another corridor, disappearing from her sight. Half running, she followed him in a hurry and turned took the turn, and tripped when something suddenly got caught in her legs. By the time she got up, he was gone. Axel breathed a sigh of relief as he finally got rid of his follower. He wasn't actually sure if anyone was following him, but since the system said, he had believed it and got rid of them as soon as he got the chance. He didn't do anything more since that'd get him into trouble, and he also didn't know who the other party was. It could have been just an innocent student under an invisibility cloak. That was brilliant, Axel. You get 1% approval for that. Axel frowned. Was it someone dangerous? That is unclear at the moment. Unlike AR, the system's knowledge is limited to people of this world. It doesn't have permission to access that person's information. That person is under the jurisdiction of another entity. Axel realized who his follower was after connecting the dots. There was only one student who had such a description. It was that purple-haired girl, right? So, she's under the jurisdiction of another entity, right? Hmm. So that's why you didn't choose her. Affirmative. AR hasn't taken her presence into consideration in any of the future events. She's a variable that can either be an ally or another enemy to be eliminated, hence the warning. Axel nodded, but then paused since he had another doubt. Wait, but didn't you say that the Akashic Records is an entity that has the records of the past, present, and future of the worlds? Then why does it not already know how things will turn out? He asked in confusion. That is only the case if there's no outside interference. The future is now unclear after the arrival of that girl into this world and your acquisition of the system. All right, I got it. AR is just playing a gamble, thought Axel as he walked along the winding corridors of Hogwarts. Now let's focus on finding me a place to stay. With that, he began to look through the corridors in search of a place to stay. While walking alone along the dark corridors, it suddenly occurred to him that nothing seemed to have changed yet. He was still as homeless as he was three years ago when he was kicked out of the orphanage. At least I left by choice this time, was his only consolation to keep his fragile pride and dignity intact. The next day, Axel woke up in an abandoned class that was near Slytherin dorms. He was tired last night, so he decided to postpone trying to find an ideal location. Thus, he just cleared a place in this abandoned classroom, locked the door, set some bells on it, and crashed here after taking out his sleeping bag from his backpack. The backpack he had was, of course, Enchan, Ted with a space extension charm and a permanent featherlight charm. The enthusiastic muggle-born shopkeeper had explained to him that a decade ago, most people used to use heavy metal trunks with an almost negligent feather-light charm on them. The enchanted ones were just too expensive and still quite heavy. But after the economic evolution, half-bloods and muggle-borns were able to buy or rent land in the Diagon Alley, and trunks with new designs, better enchantments, and cheap costs were allowed to be sold without having their shops stormed 
or banned under some silly law. And Axel was quite grateful for that. Otherwise, he'd have been lugging a heavy trunk instead of this light and handy backpack with his aching body. He can even take this to his classes. It was a bit expensive, but as far as he could see, it was money well spent. Walking out of the classroom, he went to a boy's bathroom, took a shower, and then went to the great hall for breakfast. It was already quite late, and all the tables were filled with students. Axel sat at the furthest corner of the Slytherin table, where no one was sitting. While he was eating, a prefect came and placed a piece of paper in front of him. He had several sets of papers in his hands. It's the first year timetable, he said before leaving. Axel picked up the piece of paper and looked through it. Along with his timetable, it also contained a basic description of other subjects taught at Hogwarts. Transfiguration, charms, flying, data, herbology, history of magic, astronomy, these were the compulsory subjects. Additionally, there were a lot of other subjects you could take as well. They could be taken as an elective by him, while some had an age restriction due to their advanced level. Dueling, alchemy, enchanting, ancient runes, magizoology, arithmancy, music, politics, magical science, healing, etc. Axel sighed as he looked at the list of optional subjects which seemed to go on forever. Enchanting, healing, and alchemy, which all seemed interesting, weren't available to him this year. Thankfully, dueling was a subject available for all years. Hey system, how come there are so many subjects here? He asked in surprise. A decade ago, there used to be fewer subjects. It has undergone a lot of changes after that. Really? Can you explain in more detail? Asked Axel curiously. Due to the wars and inbreeding, there weren't enough students to attend other subjects, and the school couldn't afford more teachers as well. Thus, many subjects were removed. However, now that the student population of Hogwarts has surged exponentially due to many magical families of all blood statuses migrating or sending their children out of their country to study here, and the funding from the ministry has increased, Hogwarts is slowly returning to its former glory and even surpassing it in some areas. Well, I'll be damned, this has changed as well thought Axel as a certain crazy woman popped into his head. No matter how much he hated her, he had to admit that she was one hell of a minister. She's changed everything in just one decade. That kind of makes it worse. He wouldn't have been bothered at all if an incompetent and dumb person thought so low of him. Axel clenched his crippled fists tightly. I'll definitely prove that bitch wrong, he vowed. One day, I'll make her look just as weak and pathetic in front of me as I felt in front of her. As you just saw, reincarnators are overrated. They're awfully inexperienced and don't take the situation seriously. Wasn't she almost taken out with just a crippled Axel? A true MC is someone who knows how to use his strengths. Please vote with Power Stones if you're looking forward to the future chapters. We were number three or number four yesterday, but I'm blade in updating today, so let's see. If you want to read ahead of everyone and support this piece of art, join me at Patreon. We already have 75 Tau supporters. More are joining every day. Thanks for your support. Patreon.com slash Snollygoster. Chapter 13. She is faint of heart. This fic is also being posted on ScribbleHub or Fanfiction.net. Those who can't read here anymore due to the recent update can follow this fic there. Bellatrix Black was lying in an empty room in a miserable state. Her usually beautiful and picture-perfect face looked pale and haggard. Her clothes were disheveled, which was never before seen in always prim, proper, and beautiful Minister of Magic. She numbly looked at the report that had been sent to her Magi mirror. It was just the names and houses of all the students sorted this year. Axel Hunt. He's in Slytherin, with no family background, with a crippled body, and unable to do magic. If even she was this harsh to him for no reason at all, understandably, he'll be suffering a lot during his stay there. Crack. The device fell from her hand, causing its screen to crack, but she didn't pay it any mind. Hunt. Axel Hunt. Tristan Hunt. Could she deny the truth any longer? The pendant, the uncanny resemblance, and now the same surname. Three life debts. That, plus being able to escape her fate of being a trophy wife of a Death Eater, and learning so many things that today, that she's able to be the most powerful woman in Britain, and probably the most powerful woman in the world. That's exactly how much she owed him. That was all 15 years ago. 
After helping her through her situation, he had to leave since there were people chasing after him. Left alone and not wanting to go to Britain, where her parents had sold her to Death Eaters, Bellatrix toured the whole world for years after that. With her changed perspective, thanks to that man, everything felt different to her. She was able to see the world without prejudice. When she finally returned to Britain after years, she found out that everything had changed. Andy, who was banished from the family after running away from home and marrying a muggle-born, was having a tough time raising her daughter and paying for her deranged husband's treatment. Meanwhile, Ciri was in jail, accused of being a mass murderer and a supporter of Voldemort. And every other black was dead. Except for Sissy, who'd not bother to care for anyone. She disappointed her the most. Bellatrix, who had changed by then due to the man who used to say, family comes first, decided to fight for her remaining family. She became Lady Black, reinstated Andromeda as a Black family member, and invited her to live with her once again. After that, she became the Minister of Magic and got serious a trial. With her life settled, she got to the reason behind her running for the Minister of Magic, to find Tristan Hunt and also help him out. The people who were after him were quite the mysterious bunch. Tristan used to be a part of them at one point, until one day, he realized their true goals and ran away with something. After searching for him with all the resources, imagine her surprise when she found out that Tristan was already dead. That had felt like the end of the world for her. At that time, she spent a lot of time in bereavement. And at this time, her family supported her a lot. She grieved until one day, she realized that even if he was dead, there were things she could do for him. His idealistic views, his wishes, and his brilliance could still be retained in this world through her. And most importantly, she could still take revenge on the people who were after him. After that day, almost a decade has passed, and she settled her actions during this time according to a priority list. Tristan, family. Making the country powerful enough to find out about Tristan's mysterious enemies and destroy them. Making the world a better place since Tristan wanted it so. If anyone messes with this priority, she'll not hesitate to destroy that person. Now, Axel had something that her family wanted. That's second on her list. Thus, she dealt with the situation without caring about hurting the feelings of an insignificant nobody. That was until she saw the pendant. It looked exactly the same as Tristan. From that point on, until now, she had been in denial. She kept thinking that he must be someone else. Because if he wasn't, the meaning of her actions was too horrible to think about. The words she had said to him kept ringing in her mind. Such horrible words. They shouldn't be said to another human being, let alone to the son of the person to whom she owed her everything, and more. But she can't deny it anymore. She has to accept that he is indeed the son of Tristan Hunt. That Tristan, who used to say family comes first, and tell her that she should love hers. His son has had to live on the streets, unloved, and struggling for food. That Tristan, who was an honest and honorable man, someone who even managed to change the evil her into someone a little better. His son has had to learn stealing from people. That Tristan, who couldn't even watch a stranger suffering. His son has had multiple injuries growing up, got tortured by the unforgivable Cruciatus curse, and is now crippled for life. That Tristan, who helped her so much for her without asking for anything in return, who always made sure not to be too harsh even while scolding her. She said such harsh words to his child that they shouldn't even be said to enemies. While the poor boy had always struggled hard for wealth, she had called him poor. While he had tried to be someone powerful, she had called him an insignificant nobody. While the boy trusted someone for the first time, she had broken that trust in pieces, while the boy had happiness and hope in his life for the first time, she had thoroughly crushed them without mercy. She picked up her wand. With all the things accepted, there was only one thing in her mind right now. And that is, a bitch like her deserves to be punished. At the breakfast table, Axel folded his timetable and pocketed it. He had transfiguration, the first thing today. While he was eating, the owl posts had arrived, dropping a few newspapers and a few letters. Most only had parcels. After Magi Mirror technology was introduced into Britain, 
most people who can afford it would read the news and communicate with people through it. Though there was no parcel system developed in Britain yet, so people were still dependent on owls for that one. Or rather, the ministry didn't allow that technology into Britain yet, or the hundreds of thousands of owls hatched and trained through a lot of resources would suddenly be useless. Some developed magical countries had better alternatives. At this moment, a huge pitch-black owl carrying a parcel swooped into the Great Hall, attracting a lot of attention. Most of the people recognized the owl in an instant. This breed of owls was only used by the black family. And since it was from the black family, they assumed it was for Rose, who has been adopted by the blacks. But to everyone's surprise, the owl landed in front of Axel. Axel looked at the owl in front of him with a frown. After coming out of the leaky cauldron, he had canceled the custom order of his clothes from Madame Malkin's. So he shouldn't be getting any parcels right now. He checked the details written on it and found that it was indeed addressed to his name. Is there any other Axel Hunt here? The sender? Andromeda Tonk? Axel's good mood instantly soured. Why can't this woman just leave him alone? Opening it, he found a letter and an expensive-looking wallet inside. Dear Axel, I did the rest of the shopping for you. I would have sent it earlier with Rose, but your custom clothes weren't ready at that time. Did you cancel it? They had later called me to confirm, and I denied it. Also, congratulations on your sorting to Slytherin, though I am not really sure about your family background. You never told me. And why was Hogwarts staff coming to help you with your shopping? Is there really no one to take care of you? Anyways, I saw the memory. I never knew Cyrus Greengrass was such a sick and deranged person. You have the strongest will I have ever seen in my ten years as a mind healer. I am glad the man is dead. I dead was so furious when I found out that my sister has got your memories. I don't know exactly how my sister got them, but I'd like to ask for your forgiveness for whatever she did. Bella has never been a polite person, nor a patient one. She did say you gave it voluntarily, but then I don't know why you left. Can you tell me exactly what happened? Bella hasn't come home ever since. A lot of problems are cropping up after her sudden and unexplained disappearance. She isn't replying to any of the calls. The Aurors are going to start investigating very soon, anxiously waiting for your reply. Andromeda. Axel crumpled the piece of parchment in anger. These people just wouldn't let him off. If that bitch minister wasn't found soon, the Aurors would start investigating, and as the last person who was alone with her, he'd likely be the first person to be suspected. Even if they consider the fact he was just a crippled child, they'd at least question him and probably take his memories as well. He doesn't know how it works in the magical world, but does know that police do know how to make people talk. And those methods are not pleasant. He's had first-hand treatment. Those people were merciless, even to a child. Axel opened the black leather wallet to realize that it was a lot bigger from the inside, bigger than the space in his backpack. It had all the equipment, books, and other things on the shopping list, and more. Axel didn't even give them a second glance before closing the wallet and putting it in his backpack. The way he saw it, these things were just a hoax. The main reason was that she was just worried about her dear sister. As Bellatrix had said, this much was just chump change to their coffers. When he looked up, he was surprised to see most of the students looking at him for some reason. Even some professors. Well, I'm fucked, aren't I, he realized. The last thing he wanted was attention. Attention would lead to curiosity, and curiosity would lead to people investigating his background and history. If this was still not enough attention, the girl who lived herself came to stand behind him along with Neville. She could recognize that owl from a mile away. Its name was Ader. What was it? She asked Axel as the owl flew over to settle on her shoulder. Why are you here? Axel asked her instead. She showed her timetable. We have transfiguration together. I was wondering if you'd like to come along. He was about to deny it, but when he looked at the curious students, he sighed. They had heard her invitation already. He couldn't deny it. This wasn't a question since he wasn't given a choice. Lead the way, he said, slinging his backpack over his shoulder. So, began Rose as they exited the Great Hall. You still haven't answered what Ader came to deliver. Axel shrugged, just some shopping items. 
Your Aunt Andromeda was asking if I knew where your Aunt Bella was. So, do you know anything? Asked Rose, almost too quickly. Axel sighed inwardly. He already knew that she already knew. She's not too good at acting. Axel looked at her like she was an idiot. I don't know, Rose looked at him dubiously. Really? Are you sure? She didn't look fine after she came back. Axel stopped walking for a second. He could see a noticeable change in her attitude from yesterday. Until sorting, her tone was friendly and gentle. But right after he was sorted into Slytherin, she has been looking at him differently. And her tone has also changed noticeably. He never expected anything more from her, to begin with. He returned the favor in kind. Miss Potter, let me assure you, I don't know anything. I have never met your aunt before, and I'm just a cripple who can't even do magic. Is there any way for me to know? He asked coldly before leaving the two behind. Neville snorted. See? He's already showing his Slytherin colors, isn't he? I told you yesterday, most Slytherins are evil. Gran and Dad and Uncle Sirius also say the same thing. Rose shook her head with a guilty look. But he did have a point. Why? Did I even bother asking? She was just worried for her aunt. The private forces were already moving, trying to locate her. After all, the previous attacks on the minister in the past decade, they were also not wrong for worrying. Axel didn't go to the classroom first. Instead, he asked a student for directions to the Owlery. There was a problem he needed to fix before doing anything else. Otherwise, he'll have Aurors coming to Hogwarts for questioning very soon. He had thought he'd settle it after classes, but after Rose had confronted him, he realized that it is better to do it as soon as possible. He went into an empty broom closet and took out his wand. When he touched the wand, it gave a hum of vibration along with a spark. Well, someone looks eager, he muttered. He was also eager to learn magic, but he had to do this first. Closing his eyes and touching the tip to his head, he brought a silvery thread out of his head and stored it in a plastic water bottle. The method to do this was included in the beginner occlumency package, and he was able to do it since it did not need magical skills, but mind skills. Damn, that actually worked, he muttered in slight disbelief. He was used to failing at magic by now. Host, you are quite talented, actually. Have some patience. You'll excel eventually. Like I don't know that, he thought while getting out. He was just worried that with his luck, he'll be dead long before that happens. The shining silvery thread was the memory of his entire meeting with Bellatrix, though it excluded the part of what exactly she saw in his memories. He excluded it since this could now be shown to the authorities in case Bellatrix really went missing and they wouldn't know that he had an encounter with Cyrus Greengrass, a man who had been recently murdered. And this memory would most likely also stop Andromeda from continuing her fake act of caring after knowing that her sister had already exposed her. He would have liked to add a note as well, but as expected, he can't write anything comprehensible with his fingers so unsteady. He could only tear a slip containing Andromeda's signature and stick it to the bottle. When he finally stepped into the owlery while panting due to exertion, he stopped dead in his tracks. There was a girl standing in front of the open space of the owlery, looking at the scenery while gently stroking the plumage of an owl that was resting on her shoulder. He wouldn't have bothered if it was any other girl, but it was the same girl who was following him last night. Martina didn't feel like attending the class right now, so she just skipped it. She had long realized that she can do a lot of things that others won't be allowed to do. That included skipping classes as well. Though some teachers do tend to have her learn something challenging while they teach the other students. Sadly, Potions wasn't one of them. So she came to meet Rollet, her dear owl. She had named her after the cute Pokemon Rollet since the two looked quite similar. At this moment, Rollet suddenly turned her head 180 degrees to look behind them. Turning around as well, she saw that it was a boy who was looking at her with surprise. Just as she was about to ignore him, she saw that his eyes looked familiar. As the boy turned around to find an owl, his figure overlapped with the person who had tripped her last night. Any other person wouldn't have made the connection, but she was a genius with monstrous intellect. So it was this little guy here who did that, huh? She thought with a frown, as she recalled how disgraceful it was when she fell flat on the floor while running. 
even her skirt had ridden up, had showing the forbidden scenery. It was fortunate she was invisible at that moment, or she'd have straight up used her powers then and there. Hey, you, she called out to him, making him stop. Axel cursed under his breath when she called out to him. System, should I make a run for it? Calm down, Axel. There's a point iro two percent chance of you being able to run. System would recommend talk, in things out peacefully. The magical fluctuations coming from her are insanely high. Damn. Talk about being unlucky, thought Axel as he slowly turned around to face her. He didn't know what he was expecting, but he certainly didn't expect her to just keep staring at him. Host, she's currently reading your mind. Axel jumped in surprise. What? But I didn't even keep the eye contact for more than a second, and how come I didn't feel a thing? She's at a surprisingly high level of legilimency. She doesn't need eye contact, and you can't detect it at your level. Axel panicked. So what do I do now? Don't worry. It seems like she wouldn't last long. And sure enough, Axel saw her suddenly jerk back with a gasp. System. What happened? Did you block her? No. Blocking her would have led to more trouble, as you are not supposed to be able to block her. System simply concealed all the information about itself, along with other sensitive information, and threw out some of your bad memories to test her out. She didn't last long. It seems that she is faint of heart. Gasp! Martina gasped as she retracted her legilimancy probe. She just couldn't watch it anymore. Like most reincarnators, she had no qualms about casually entering people's minds. She had just wanted to check what kind of person he was and how he knew someone was following him yesterday. And if he had gotten lucky and caught a glimpse by chance, but who would have thought that things will backfire on her again, and she'll be traumatized just by watching an eleven-year-old's memories? How can someone live properly after experiencing all that? Scratch that. How can someone be alive after suffering through all those beatings? At this moment, she heard him call her, bringing her out of her state of shock. Excuse me, did you have any business with me? No? He didn't wait for her reply, and just went along on to find an owl to put the small, transparent bottle in his hand into the owl's pouch. As soon as he was done, Axel made a beeline for the exit before the stunned girl could do anything. One of my biggest chapters. Give me power stones. Oh, about being weak. Look at the title of chapter 15 on Pat Rion. Come read ahead and support this novel on Patren. To the 90 so supporters, thanks for support. It has motivated me to put in more effort. Partyon.com slash Snollygostzar. Chapter 14. An Angel? Chapter 14. Posting on Scribblehub soon. Also on fanfiction.net and Royal Road. Axel walked into a large classroom that had at least 100 students at the moment. He had barely made it in time. There was a black tabby cat on the table, staring at all the students with its yellow eyes. Axel went straight to the last table to sit and took out his transfiguration textbook along with his wand. Whoa! Blimey! Professor? The tabby cat turned out to be Professor McGonagall, which kinda impressed Axel. He wondered what animal he'll turn into. His excitement, however, quickly died down. He'd been called a street rat too many times. He's terrified that it'll turn into reality. McGonagall ignored the surprised reaction of the students as she began the classes. Welcome to your very first class of Transfiguration. Transfiguration is a very systematic exact magical discipline, working best for the scientifically inclined mind, and as such, it is deemed very hard work, especially compared to charms, which affords a much larger margin for personal creativity. Also when transfiguring, it is important to make firm and decisive wand movements. Do not wiggle or twirl your wand unnecessarily, or the transfiguration will certainly be unsuccessful. Axel instantly started to dislike the subject just by the description. But then, McGonagall, as if knowing what the students were thinking, pointed her wand at the desk which instantly turned into a pig. Though, with experience and practice, you can do things with transfiguration that can help in infinite ways, she said, turning the desk into a few more things before turning it back into a chair. The students grew excited upon seeing the magic, so she gave out a warning. Transfiguration is some of the most complex and dangerous magic you will learn at Hogwarts, she said. Anyone messing around in my class will leave and not come back. You have been warned. McGonagall had the students write a lot of complicated notes, 
none of which Axel could write with his crippled hand. There were a number of factors a wizard had to take into account when carrying out transfiguration spells. The intended transformation, T, was directly influenced by body weight, A, viciousness, V, wand power, W, concentration, C, and a fifth unknown variable, Z. Only after she was done explaining did she allow the students to turn their matchsticks into needles. Axel frowned. System. Was McGonagall also considering these theories and this complicated formula during her transfiguration? That was instant magic, with no precise wand waving, chanting, or calculation. No, Axel. After a large amount of practice, you can gain enough control over your magic that it simply listens to your will and executes it. Most of these formulae and theories will be useless by then. Axel frowned as he tried the spell following everything instructed by McGonagall. With his trembling hand, he couldn't even perform the wand movement correctly. Not a single change happened to the matchstick. When he looked at Rose's table, he saw that she had already changed hers into a silver-pointed needle, though he saw that most of the students were in a similar situation as him. Only those who had practiced with a wand before were able to do it. Axel shook his head. Nope, this won't do, he thought. Just like in charms, wand movements are a no-go for him. Professor, he called out, raising his hand. McGonagall, who was praising Rose, turned towards him. Yes, Mr. Hunt? Oh, so she did remember his name. Her acclumency must be impressive. There were so many students. Can I get more matchsticks? Yes, how many do you want? Ah, about a hundred will do, ma'am. That got a few raised eyebrows, a few turned heads, and some snickers. McGonagall frowned, but she did humor the boy. You are only allowed to use one at a time, she said, before sending out a box of matches to his desk. She remembers his name because the master healer Andromeda Black had personally sent a letter to a heir, requesting her to take care of Axel since he had recently suffered debilitating injuries which have rendered him unable to use magic and write his homework. McGonagall has also passed on the message to other teachers. Thus, just now when he made the weird request, she just let the boy have the matches if that's what he wanted before turning her attention back to the other students. Axel, not knowing all this, thanked her before getting to work. This time, he skipped all the complicated stuff and straight up ordered the matchstick to turn into a needle while chanting the spell. He also made sure to shield his face with his other hand. Puff! And he was right in doing so. The matchstick broke into pieces due to excessive magic, but he noticed that there were traces of silver in the splinters. Wand movements are there for directing and controlling the flow of your magic. Without them, and with no practice, the magic is splashing colors on a canvas instead of painting with a brush. All right, less output, thought Axel, as he ignored the intense pain that was caused by using magic. This time, the match didn't break into pieces right away, but the shape got disfigured and it still broke in the end. With every attempt, he'll take observations and make changes to his magic. He was not blindly wasting matchsticks. He was getting better results with each broken stick. After about 20 tries, Axel was in a much worse condition, and his head was throbbing. But he also had a somewhat passable silver needle in his hands. Meanwhile, the others who had never tried it were still struggling to make any changes using McGonagall's complicated method. Very good, Axel. Transfiguration is supposed to be very difficult compared to charms. You manage to bring results using a practical approach that complements your extreme mental talent. Plus 1% approval. Total, 9%. A new system feature will be unlocked when you reach 10 cent. Axel didn't pay much attention to the system. He'd be happy to accept whatever help comes from the system, but he doesn't want to be too dependent on it. The new feature might be good, but isn't it useless right now? He decided to perfect this spell. He could feel his control over the magic getting stronger. He should practice on these matchsticks as much as possible since he'd not have many test subjects while practicing with a live animal or a larger item. When it was approaching time to end the classes, McGonagall glanced at the boy on the last bench once again. She was surprised to see a bunch of silver needles lying on his desk along with a number of splinters. He was clutching a handkerchief to his nose with one hand while practicing the spell with the other. She frowned. Something was not right. 
When she walked closer and observed closely, her shock intensified by several folds. The first thing she noticed was that his condition wasn't good at all. Bloodshot eyes with traces of blood on the handkerchief and veins on his trembling hands and forehead were popping out. The second thing that surprised her was that the boy wasn't making any wand movements while performing the spell. He was only chanting the incantation, and the matchstick was slowly turning into a silver needle. Mr. Hunt, stop it this instant, she ordered. Axel stopped for a moment to look up. Yes, Professor? he asked in confusion. McGonagall's lips formed a hard line as she sternly looked at him. I was under the impression that you are suffering from debilitating injuries and are unable to perform magic until treated. Axel frowned. What the heck? How did she know? He shook his head. I don't remember mentioning this to anyone, Professor. I am injured, yes, but I can still learn magic. It's just a bit harder for me, he answered, trying to downplay it. A bit harder, repeated McGonagall, giving him a once-over. She pulled off his handkerchief, which was covered in blood from the other side. Clearly, it's more than a bit harder for you, Mr. Hunt. No more magic for the rest of the class. Axel, considered explainy, jived to this woman that he was in fact fine, but decided against it. He knew her kind. She'll ignore him like a girl ignoring her ex. Putting on a reluctant expression, he said, Yes, Professor, I won't. Let you catch me, he added in his mind in a deadpan. Like hell, anyone can stop him from learning magic. With his skills, it's just a minor inconvenience, but he'll have to get formal proof from the healer here, stating that there was no harm. Seeing the obedient boy, McGonagall's eyes softened. That being said, you put in a tremendous amount of effort and managed to learn the spell, while a certified master healer said it will be impossible for you to cast magic. Ten point to Slytherin, she said, and Axel could have sworn he saw reluctance in her expression. Anyone a few years older would have been shocked silly witnessing this event. McGonagall, awarding ten points straight to a Slytherin? Now that's something you don't get to see often. Axel nodded and thanked her. But in actuality, he couldn't care less about some silly house points. Especially for Slytherin. He'd rather Slytherin come last in the house cup. On the other hand, Draco Malfoy, who was still unsuccessful in turning his matchstick into a needle, gritted his teeth while glaring at Axel. Axel spent the rest of the class practicing as well. Of course, McGonagall didn't catch any abnormalities this time. Flitwick's class turned out to be much better since he could practice freely there after taking a back seat while hiding from the diminutive professor. Susan had invited him to sit with her, but he had refused since she was sitting in the front. Plus, Hannah didn't seem too eager to sit him. Defense against the dark arts, though, Axel had arrived early and claimed his back seat. What he didn't expect was someone to actually come and sit beside him. Axel looked at Daphne in surprise. He had noticed that most of the students from other houses would avoid a Slytherin. Even Rose and Susan's treatment of him had subtly changed. So he wasn't expecting her of all people to come and sit beside him. Don't look so surprised. I was planning on getting some sleep so I came here. My friends refused to sit in the back seat so they are in the front. She said, pointing at a few Ravenclaw girls. The meaning of her words was clear. I'm not a loner like you, bruh. I need you to inform me if that woman comes here or looks our way. Axel raised his eyebrows. You're not going to try learning? Daphne shook her head. I have already covered the first year syllabus. My father made sure of that, she said, injecting the word father with a lot of venom. The corner of Axel's mouth tugged upward. Your father must have been a great asshole, he said with a smirk. After all, he had first-hand experience. It felt good to curse someone's father right to their face without worrying about the consequences. Daphne's mouth opened in surprise upon hearing the crass word, but she realized that it was indeed an apt description of that man. She nodded. Yes, he indeed, an asshole, she said, saying the word for the first time. It felt liberating. That man had forbidden her from doing anything unladylike. Axel smiled for real this time. She sounded so innocent saying the word for the first time. It was like he was corrupting an innocent little child. This was turning out to be an interesting conversation. Daphne continued, the subject of her father's death being a really refreshing subject. When I realized that he was dead, 
I smiled a real smile for the first time in a long time. Same with Mum. Really, the person who killed him must be an angel. Hmm. <laughs> Axel almost laughed out loud. Yeah, I am sure. He must have been chosen by the god, he said, nodding in amusement. While it was Daphne's first time using a bad word, it was Axel's first time having an enjoyable conversation with someone. But as interesting as their conversation was, it had to be cut short since a toad-like woman in pink had made her way behind the front desk. Well, good afternoon, she said when finally the whole class had settled down. A few people mumbled, good afternoon, in reply. Tut tut, said Professor Umbridge. That won't do now, will it? I should like you please to reply, good afternoon, Professor Umbridge. One more time, please. Good afternoon, class. Good afternoon, Professor Umbridge, they chanted back at her. There now, said Professor Umbridge sweetly. That wasn't too difficult, was it? Wands away and quills out, please. The first thing the woman did after entering was this. The first years weren't all too sensible and polite. One of the Slytherins asked the question in everyone's mind. We won't be using the wand, asked Draco Malfoy in dissatisfaction. Umbridge gave him her characteristic creepy smile. What is your name, dear? Malfoy puffed out his chest. I'm Draco Malfoy. Pure blood heir to the Malfoy family, he said arrogantly. Umbridge smiled in approval. Oh, a pure blood, very good. You see, Draco, magic should only be taught to people who are worthy. Now, do you think everyone here is worthy? Malfoy's gaze swept over to some of the mudbloods he knew. No, he said with a sneer. Only, very good, said Umbridge, cutting him off. You see, Draco, I have a lot of magic I can teach, she said, levitating the book in front of her with just a finger but it'll only be taught to the worthy. Meanwhile, in the class, we'll be covering all the basic syllabus that you all will need to pass the exams, she said sweetly. Axel's mood sank. He was somehow sure that he would not be among the so-called worthy people. Host, you should stay wary of this woman. She has dark magical power hidden in her. It was undetectable until she used her magic just now. She can't conceal it very well while using her magic. Damn, this woman... He knew something was wrong with her from the very beginning. Her eyes give him the same chills he got from Daphne's dear dark daddy. Nice instincts. They'll help you live longer. No shit, system. Daphne frowned, no longer looking in the mood to sleep. I don't like this woman, she stated flatly. Axel nodded. You see it too? Daphne looked at him in surprise. What? she asked. Those eyes. She's bad news. I wouldn't recommend sleeping, Axel warned. It was none of his business, really but sitting beside her, he didn't want to be implicated. Daphne's eyes widened in surprise. She wanted to say something, but Umbridge tutted everyone into silence as she began teaching everyone from the textbook. Axel realized that he wasn't going to learn anything in that class, so he started practicing levitating under his desk. After this, it was dinner time, but Axel didn't directly go to the Great Hall. Instead, he first went to the library. He was already feeling lethargic from all the exertion, but it's not the first time he's feeling like shit. He can count on his fingers how many times in the last three years he was feeling completely fine with no injuries, no hunger, not freezing with cold, not feeling feverish, etc. Thus, he's learned to stop complaining and just do it. While panting, he soldiered on to climb the stairs and walk the long corridors before finding the library. Oi, system. Recommend me some books on offensive magic and other useful magic, which are good enough that I can actually learn from them, he ordered. If this thing can't even help him this much, he's straight up rejecting the whole saving the world thing. Thankfully, the system didn't turn out to be completely useless for once, and recommended to him some books which he had to dig out and pluck out from all kinds of places in the library. He realized that these smart-ass students had hidden the good ones at places where no one else would find them, and these books had been hidden for God knows how long. Anyways, why is he borrowing the books? It's because after attending these classes, he has realized that even with his crippled body, he is already getting ahead of what McGonagall and Flitwick are teaching the students. Which I, it's nothing to be impressed about, considering the strength of his enemies. In fact, it's quite funny and worrying how he is fretting about school bullies while he has to fight an army of creatures from another dimension along with the most powerful Dark Lord. Thus, he's going to have to learn magic on his own, 
ahead of everyone else. He needs to gain strength quickly. And power stones, whatever you are left with. Next chapter title, not weak anymore. Congratulations to the top three fans for getting advanced chapters. Come DM me on Discord, show me your profile pic screenshot and get the chapters. Necrom has already got the chapters and will now daily get one more advanced chapter every day until next month. You can become top fans by increasing your fan value by voting with Power Stones, commenting, and reviewing. You can see your fan value beneath the synopsis and know of chapters. For reading ahead and supporting me, come to Patreon, patreon.com slash snollygoster. Damn 100 patrons, it's a century. Chapter 15, Not Weak Anymore. Axel brought the books recommended by the system to the librarian for borrowing. Upon seeing the titles, the lady looked at him in pleasant surprise. She let him borrow the books and even thanked him for finding them. Some of them have been hidden for centuries. I wouldn't mind even if you borrow these for a year now. Of course, Axel had to answer how he found them, to which he simply said, you just have to find the best places to hide them. With the books in his bag, Axel made his way back to the Great Hall for dinner. He took a seat alone at the furthest corner of the table, near the professor's table. He decided to check out the books he'd borrowed. While he was eating peacefully while reading one of the books, someone annoyingly disturbed him. Hey, Hunt, I heard you were a cripple? asked Malfoy, purposefully making his voice loud so that others could hear it too. Axel mentally let out a sigh. This guy is starting to get on his nerves. Just a disclaimer, but those who get on his nerves don't usually end well. Axel nodded, looking at him with a sympathetic look. Yeah, Blondie, must have sucked, right? Even a cripple is better than you at magic, he said, one hand holding a goblet while his face made a lopsided mocking expression. Meme. Leonardo DiCaprio. There were some sniggers and catcalls from those who heard. That should have shut him up. Sadly, this guy was denser than Axel gave him credit for. Oh, you think you're better? How laughable, he said, pulling his wand out. Axel didn't look the least bit phased. Yeah, I think I am. At least I read the rules before coming here and haven't embarrassed my house in public, he said before glancing at the teacher's table, where some of the teachers had their eyes on them. He had expected his head of house professor Snape to take action, but the bastard just stared at them like he didn't intend to do anything. Git, thought Axel. He had seen the same guy taking action against several Gryffindors this morning for the smallest of things. No matter, someone could match him in his pettiness, apparently. Mr. Malfoy, it is against the rules to point your wand at a fellow student. Five points from Slytherin, said McGonagall from her seat. Axel was sitting in the corner, being the closest to the teachers for a reason after all. Malfoy's face was worth watching at that moment. And upon losing points, even the other Slytherins glared at him. Pure blood or not, that was entirely his fault. He was like a Gryffindor, while the other boy acted like a Slytherin should. Malfoy's face turned purple as he glared at Axel angrily. You just meet me in the dueling class, Hunt. I'll show who's better then, he said before leaving. Dueling class, huh? Axel had almost forgotten about it. It was tomorrow, and it was held together for all the houses of the same year. He glanced at the professor who was going to teach them dueling. It was a tall and athletic beautiful woman with blonde hair and hazel eyes. Her name was Alice Longbottom, an ex-auror and a famous duelist. Neville Longbottom doesn't act so confident at Hogwarts for no reason. His mum teaches dueling at Hogwarts. Axel would have looked forward to the dueling class if he had a good background and a healthy body. But in his current state, it's going to be difficult. But he still has to go. He knows nothing about magical combat, and the fights from now on are going to heavily involve magic. That night, the first thing he did after going to the Slytherin dorms was to change his door plate with another door plate containing a different name. This one was stuck to a room that was not occupied by anyone. After that, he put his own door plate in his bag and left the dorms for good. Though he could technically stay in another dorm as well, but it's not worth it staying at this place longer. The people here are very punchable, and his crippled hands have been itching for a while. Malfoy's already after him, and retaliating openly will attract attention and curiosity to his back row, und. 
Now that he has no room to his name in this huge dorm, no one would find out that he never stayed in his room. There are so many rooms and they'd never even find his name. This is in case someone like Malfoy tried to ambush him at night, only to find that he was not in his room. Then they can complain that he's been breaking the curfew. Now, he won't bother showing up here at all. There's so many students that even he can't tell whether any of them are coming to the dorm every night or not. With things sorted out, he had officially left the Slytherin dorms. Somehow, he felt much more comfortable now. Maybe he's used to being homeless now. Now he can stay wherever he wants in this castle. Right now, even though he was dead tired, he decided to practice some magic and acclumency first. Being tired is no excuse. If you can do it without suffering any consequences, then you're just being lazy. It also helps that he has a genuine drive to learn magic. While navigating between his classes today, he had also been scouting for locations to practice magic and sleep. He had come across a huge room with hundreds of training dummies, targets, and other dueling equipment. It was the place where the dueling classes are usually held. But of course, he's not going there right now. He is not the only one who would want to practice magic at night. Thus, he's sure there'd definitely be someone else there, or at least the prefects would go there to check if anyone was there. During the day, he had casually stolen a few dummies and targets from there after confirming with the system that there was no risk. Now they'll come to his use. He went back to the classroom that was his bedroom yesterday, locked the door, and set up the dummies and targets. By now, he'd only learned three spells. One, Lumos. Two, Levitation, three, transfiguration of a matchstick into a needle. Quite useless, if I do say so myself, he muttered. He took out the books he'd borrowed from the library. Go. Flipping through the pages of some of the best books of Hogwarts library, he gulped upon seeing so many types of spells. These included the spells in Hogwarts' normal curriculum, as well along with the other spells. And the difficulty varied from the first year to the seventh year, and some even above that. All right. Let's start slow, he muttered. He was sure he can't learn any of them with his disabilities. Heck, even his Lumos light is quite weak and fluctuating. Thus, he has to do something about this. There has to be a way. That's his primary goal. His other immediate goal is to learn some spells that can be used even in his crippled state. For that, he examined his current state. His hands, specifically, his fingers had suffered major damage and he had little to no control over them. But his legs, even though they hurt all the time and he can't make rapid movements, his legs are still fine. That is, he still hasn't lost the incredible balance and grace of a master thief. Hmm? It can be used, he thought, as all sorts of fighting scenarios flashed through his mind. All right, system, can you tell me which spells I can cast with my current condition and are useful to me? With 9% approval, affirmative. It is possible if you ask. The system recommended to him a few spells which he could practice. Ah, system, are you sure I can do all these? Asked Chris, checking the difficulty level of some of the spells. There was one even above seventh year difficulty. Affirmative, as previously mentioned, you have an extreme mental talent, Axel. Not even those above seventh year are able to take a cruciatus curse without suffering mental damage. A spell requires both magical and mental contribution to complete. The spells recommended by the system need about 90% mental contribution and only 10% magical. Great. He looked at the spells. Some of them are going to take a long time to practice. It's better to just learn the easiest ones first in order to at least have some modicum of safety, so that he won't be helpless in case someone attacks him. The very first spell, a smoke-producing spell. Yep, as an experienced thief, he knows the fundamental requirements of becoming strong. Step 1. Learn how to distract and run so that you survive long enough to make the tables turn. Officio fumis. Create smoke. It was supposed to produce a continuous stream of smoke that's quite thick, but when he muttered the incantation without wand movement, his wand produced a few fumes as if coughing them out. But Axel actually smiled. This was already much better than most of his attempts to use other spells. And this spell doesn't need any direction, so the wand movements are redundant. After reading the theory a few more times and getting a perfect image for the fumes he wanted, he casts the spell with much more focus and much more force. 
This time, he was able to produce the smoke, and even if the power was somewhat lower, it'd still get the job done. He cast it a few more times, getting better each time. All right, he said before flipping the pages. Before he tried another spell from the list, he had to test one thing. Can he even hit the target? To find that out, he tried out the Red Spark spell. It's just a spell that sends out a beam of light at the target. No attack power. Uses very little magic power. Vermilius, he chanted, aiming at the target. Damn, he muttered after looking at the results, his, elf, his voice filled with bitterness. He had completely missed the mark. Looking at his trembling hands, which once used to be able to even throw knives with accuracy, he sighed. For now, he can't learn any shooting beam type of spells like Stupefy or Expelliarmus with this shitty aim. But not all hope was lost. There were still spells that he could perform. The smoothening spell, or the polishing spell. It temporarily makes the object very smooth by layering the spell magic on top of the object. The spell effect can be stacked. Lubricus Natorum. Once again, no need for direction. This is another spell he can use very well. This is going to be a very useful. He quickly learned this, and its counter charm as well. Now, for the next and probably the last spell today, Electric Zap. He really, really, really liked this one. It was one of the more unique spells in the book. You just chant the spell repeatedly. After every chant, the charge keeps accumulating on your wand. The amount of charge you can accumulate depends on your mental strength. He thoroughly read the theory. One benefit of these books was that the theory and explanation was quite precise and practical. After building up his intent for a while, he gave it a try. Electrica Impulsa, he muttered, and was rewarded with a small shark travel up his wand. He grinned. Putting more power, he tried again. In his second try, the spark a much more power than the previous one. This really is quite interesting, he muttered. A few minutes later. This is... Amazing! He exclaimed over the loud crackling noise, looking at his wand crackling with an incredible amount of power accumulated on it. He was in a tremendous amount of pain right now. It was almost similar to Cruciatus, and it was because using magic hurts even when he used to use a little bit of magic. Right now, he'd used up all of his magic and was holding it all together with his mental power. The number of times an average wizard could stack up the charge with this was three times before it blows in their face because they can't control it. How much have I already loaded, system? He asked the system while the whole room was lit with a dazzling blue glow. Axel, you've chanted the spell for exactly 34 times by now. It is recommended that you don't go any further. Axel was already feeling lightheaded. Looks like this was the extent of his magic, for now. Point, his magic power. He still had some mental power to spare. Hey, system. How do I cancel it? He asked. There's no way you can release it here without blowing things up. You need to release it out of the window. What? This thing can be released as well? I thought this wasn't a ranged attack and I have to touch my wand to them in order attack? He asked. Yes, but the amount of magical power you've put in it has made ranged attacks to be possible. All right, Axel didn't delay any longer. How do I do this? A moment later, a bright blue bolt of lightning flew up into the clouds, leaving a loud sound of thunderclap after it. Axel stood there, swaying back and forth, as he struggled to keep standing. This, the system was right. Mental power can be huge boon. He isn't actually as weak as he thought. A beautiful but malicious woman's image came to his mind. Bitch, who said I'm weak? He muttered before he fell to the floor, already asleep, unconscious. Here it is. As you see, the mental talent can be quite an asset. He has started to become strong. I've made some new spells for him, and the last one is something only he can use to this extent due to his mental power. It'd be just a taser in anyone else's hands. Next chapter, a challenge I'm updating whenever I can at this point. The future chapters are just so awesome that some of them need a little more time to write. Just keep giving me the power stones and I'll keep them chapters coming. Do we have a deal? Number one. On the rankings, there are 10 more chapters at <laughs> patreon.com slash snollygoster. Also, tiemaster9903, the number three top fan of this fic, has also got the extra chapters and will get one advanced chapter each day from now on. Congratulations. Others can be the next if they overtake the top three.
Chapter 16, A Challenge. Andromeda looked up as an owl and entered through the kitchen window after it successfully passed the wards. Seeing that it was wearing the Hogwarts insignia, she curiously stood up to see what it had brought. Her correspondence with McGonagall was easily done through the Magi mirror, so she didn't know what it could have been. Is Axel's reply here? Thinking this, her actions hastened. Her sister still hadn't come back. Though there was indeed a message from her through the Magi mirror, it said, I'm alive. Don't bother me. But can a single text make her stop worrying? No. This in fact confirmed that something was indeed wrong. Quickly checking the leather pouch tied to the owl, Andromeda frowned. It was a small transparent water bottle with a silvery mist floating inside. A memory? She saw that there was a slip of paper with her name stuck on it, and the other one had Axel's name on it. Both were in her handwriting. Axel sent her a memory? This reminded her of the last memory she'd seen. It was of Axel being tortured by Cyrus Greengrass of all people. Andromeda shuddered. She had cried for a whole day after seeing that. A boy as young as eleven years old, having to go through that? Her husband was left a crying and begging mess after that torture, and an eleven-year-old, whose magic isn't even strong enough to protect him, and whose body isn't even strong enough to withstand it, had to go through it. And surprisingly, unlike her husband, that boy is so strong that he was still fighting till the last minute. Even now, she couldn't tell how. After going through all that, when he woke up after two days and after releasing that he'd been crippled for life, all he did was nod his head calmly, as if that's what he'd expected. It was so absurd that she suspected whether this was an adult sitting in a child's body. At that time, realizing that the boy must have suffered a lot to have matured this early, she had felt a strong desire to protect this boy and let him have a happy life. It was because she thought that even if she couldn't cure her husband, at least this child could still be saved. Thus, she tried to help him and tried making him feel happiness by taking him out to Diagon Alley. She had even introduced him to her family in hopes that he'll have a good time and in hopes that he could get along with Rose, someone his age. And it did seem to have worked. She had seen the boy start to genuinely enjoy himself and smile more. But after that, He'd gone to the washroom, and Bella had gone out saying she had an urgent call on her magi mirror. And boy did she regret believing her sister and letting her go. When Bella returned with the memory, Andromeda had instantly lost her temper at her. But Bella didn't seem to hear her as she just replied that it was consented before she disapparated off to Merlin's nosewear. Axel had also left without saying anything. Now he sent another memory. What could it be? Did he know what happened to Bella? Andromeda brought out one of their pensieves to check it out. It was a small pensieve, imported from a developed magical country. It had a lot of advanced features like enhanced quality and sound amplification. She quickly poured the misty liquid-like memory into the pensieve and peered into it. Instantly, the world around her changed, and she found herself in the leaky cauldron in front of the men's bathroom. She saw Axel exiting the bathroom and Bellatrix standing right in front of him, waiting. This, is this Axel's memory? How did he extract it? She thought, but her thoughts were paused when she heard Bella say, Cyrus Greengrass, the name of the man you killed, thought you should know. Andromeda got a huge shock hearing those words. Cyrus Greengrass, the man who'd tortured Chris in the memory Bella had given her. That man was killed by Axel? So, he even had to kill someone while so young. Life is so unfair sometimes, she thought, but her thoughts paused again when she witnessed Bella blackmailing Axel for the B memory. Andromeda wouldn't agree to this, she heard Axel say, trying to look calm. Yes, I don't agree, Andromeda exclaimed. She didn't like where this was going, but Bellatrix actually laughed, sounding genuinely amused. I see, she did a very good job in manipulating you. No, I didn't, not this time, shouted Andromeda. No one but Bella had known that she wasn't actually as kind-hearted as she pretended to be. But not this time. Yes, in the beginning, she had just thought that she'll peer into his mind to see the memories. But after seeing him and getting to know him and his circumstances, she had decided against it. This person had experienced what her husband had experienced and had even survived it. 
he deserved her respect and recognition for that. And after seeing him experiencing various basic joys of life for the first time, she even rejected the idea of peering through his mind, even with his consent. Because every time he had asked why she was doing all that for him, it had dug painfully at her conscience. She couldn't bear to break the trust that had been gained after seeing so much reluctance in those eyes. Thus, ultimately, she had genuinely decided not to ask him about the memories. Sadly, the scene she was witnessing made her fears come true. Hearing Bellatrix's words, Axel paused. What are you talking about? Andromeda could hear the edge in his voice and see the last bit of hope in his eyes. It's funny, really, how she's created a perfect image of herself in your mind so quickly. Let me enlighten you, you gullible kid. Andromeda is a black. She's no kind woman. No, she whispered as she saw the last bit of hope die out from his eyes, his hurt emotions clearly visible on his face at this moment. The first time Andromeda got to see his true emotion turned out to be like this. Bella was right. She was no kind woman when it comes to the well-being of her husband and daughter. But not this time. Or was it? She herself didn't know anymore. But Bellatrix wasn't done yet. Andromeda knew that once Bella decides to do something, she'll finish it without care. She just wants to get the memory. She wouldn't care about Axel. And though her fears came true, Bella turned out to be much more brutal than she had thought. You think she did all this out of kindness? Wrong. Wake up, kid. Who are you to her? A nobody. Do you know how many have died for the sake of finding a cure for her husband? How long has she known you for? A day and a half. You tell me, kid. Who's she gonna choose between her husband she's known for decades or you? She's kind, my perfect pure blood arse. She did all this because she thought it was the easier method. Just throw some money and some kindness to a homeless kid and he'll give you anything you want and still thank you afterward. But looking at you, I can tell. You wouldn't have agreed, would you? So, for the sake of my sister, I'll do this and then we go our separate ways. Now do you agree or do I need to force you? Tears came out of Andromeda's eyes when she heard her sister's words. She saw how Axel's expressions changed with each sentence as they were cutting deep into him scarring him forever as his pain turned into apathy. He actually agreed to Bellatrix's oh-so-polite request and even thanked her. I was getting too hopeful and positive about this world, he said self-mockingly. You reminded me once again that I should never trust anyone and learn to be satisfied with loneliness. It broke her heart to hear him say that. She knew that he had changed, almost irreversibly, she could almost see the walls building up around him once again, shutting out everyone, this time stronger than ever. Then the scene in the memory changed to the time right after Bella had exited his mind. No one, not even Axel, would notice anything about her, but Andromeda could. She looked shaken, almost as if denying reality. What happened? thought Andromeda. She saw Bellatrix trying to stop him and then recoiling back when Axel glared at her. He refused to stay e, then a moment more and his final words got ingrained in Andromeda's mind. Also, make sure to show the memory to your sister. Tell her that her husband was just a pussy who suffered no hardships if he couldn't even take that much torture. She should stop hurting innocent people for such a weakling and find herself a real man. With those words, he left, while Bella stood there as if someone had petrified her. The memory had ended, but Andromeda just stood there, too stunned to even speak. Why was Bella looking so panicked after seeing his memory? What did she see? Was it the reason for her disappearance? Are her efforts really so useless? And was Ted? No. The memory Axel thought would clarify everything had instead left Andromeda much more distressed and disconcerted than before, and his last words had left a lot to think about for her. Early in the morning, Axel went to the dueling arena for the dueling class. He was surprised to see that most of the first years had picked dueling even though it was an extracurricular subject. That was clearly indicating its importance. Neville's mom was standing in the middle of one of the dueling circuits. She was wearing a pair of jeans, a dueling robe, and a t-shirt underneath saying, Super Mom. Good morning, sweetie bun. How was your first night in the dormitory? Did you sleep well? She asked Neville right in front of everyone. Mom. 
Embarrassment was understandably written all over Neville's beet red face, and for once, Axel was grateful he didn't have parents. Professor Alice just laughed, finding her son's reaction cute. All right, class, gather around, she said, clapping her hands together. So, she began. Dueling. We all know what it is, but let's just recall it once again. Would anyone venture to explain? There were several people who raised their hands, but Professor Alice chose a bushy-haired girl who seemed much more eager. Yes, miss? Hermione Granger, ma'am, said the girl before she instantly began speaking. Dueling. In Wizarding Britain, it used to be a formal practice in wizarding culture in which two or more wizards or witches engaged in combat under the condition that only magical means could be used. But after Britain reconnected with the International Committee of Dueling in the past decade, the rules have changed since many magical communities depend heavily on body movements like the Greek warriors or the Japanese ninjutsu users. Now the combatants face each other and bow as a sign of respect before they place themselves in an accepted combative position and at the count of three, attempt to disarm, stun, injure, defeat, or kill each other in order to force submission through either physical and magical means. She finished. In wonder, Professor Alice clapped for her. You have a very detailed knowledge, Miss Hermione. Does anyone else have anything to add? Nothing? Then let's move on to demonstrations. Any volunteers? Apparently that was enough wait for someone. Me, Professor? shouted Draco Malfoy, before stepping up into the dueling circuit. Turning around to face everyone, he loudly yelled, I challenge Axel Hunt to a duel. We number two last week. Let's aim for number one this time. Just keep it up, and I'll keep writing the best. This chapter had Andromeda's reaction, and yep, even if the whole world changed, Draco is still the same. There's a hint about the existence of other magical communities as well. Now you might be wondering how Axel would beat him. Just see it in the next chapter. It's going to be insane. If you want to read ahead, join us at preonpatry.com slash Chapter 17. Insane skills and a thorough crushing Chapter 17. Standing at the elevated dueling circuit, Draco Malfoy yelled, I challenge Axel Hunt to a duel. What the? Before Professor Alice or Axel could say anything, the hundreds of first years who were piled around them started making a ruckus, cheering or hooting. You have to say, wizards are a drama-loving bunch. These kids didn't know who the heck Axel Hunt was, but they knew they were in for some drama. Axel pondered what to do. It wasn't like he was particularly angry, just annoyed. Who would bother losing their temper against an annoying bug bugging them? But that's not to say that they won't take satisfaction in crushing that bug. He looked around at the naive kids cheering for Draco, as if they'd get to see a duel similar to how they'd seen on their magi mirrors. He mentally shook his head. He wasn't in a good condition. He can't deny that. He can't do magic properly. He can't deny that. He isn't fast or dexterous anymore. He can't deny that. But, even without any of this, he'd never be in a bad enough condition that bugs like these start to think they can beat him in a fight. All right, he was done thinking everything through. There weren't any consequences major enough to stop him from giving this bug a good crushing. Cracking his neck from side to side, he stepped forward. I accept, he announced in a voice that wasn't loud, huff, yet it reached every ear through the noise of the crowd. Whoa! Yeah! Fight! The peanut gallery was fully enjoying the free show. Professor Alice, thinking that it was all fun and games, didn't stop the two. All right, a dueling challenge on the very first day. What a great way to start. Come up, you two, she said, not knowing that the intentions of the participants were quite dark. First years won't be able to do much anyway. Under everyone's encouragement, Axel stepped into the ring, facing off against Malfoy. He still had his hands in his robe pockets while he stood relaxedly in the ring. His presence alone exuded a pressure that'll make a skilled fighter know that he was not an easy opponent. Professor Alice also couldn't help giving him one more glance, wondering if she was imagining things. All right, no lethal spells, and I'll be stopping the duel before anyone could get seriously hurt. She announced before stepping out of the ring. Now, bow before standing on the two opposite spots. Standing right in front of Axel, Draco did an imperceptible bow. Scared, cripple? He asked with a smirk. Axel nodded. About one thing, he admitted before he looked at the professor. 
Professor, what if I accidentally seriously injure him? He asked, making Draco grit his teeth. Professor Alice had heard this question too many times. Too many students hesitate to even cast spells at each other these days. Even her nevy has similar problems. Don't worry, dear. You are under my supervision, so I'll stop before anything serious happens. Besides, injuries are common in dueling. If your spell was non-lethal, then you won't get into trouble, she answered as if she already had this answer memorized. What she didn't know was that Axel had asked this question on purpose so that he won't be blamed later. They both took distance from each other and took the spots that had been marked on each side of the circuit. Wands ready, announced Professor Alice. Draco leveled his wand against Axel while Axel was still standing with his hands in his open robes pockets. The next thing Professor Alice was supposed to do was say, start, but she paused when Axel didn't draw out his wand. Though apparently, this was enough of an announcement for Draco, since he already brandished his wand, yelling out his first spell even before the match officially started. Fernunculus. A jinx that causes a serious breakout of acid boils or pimples. A sickly green beam was shot at Axel, but everyone was surprised to see that while the spell beam approached him, Axel didn't move at all. The spell beam whizzed past him, passing Kak G over the heads of the observers below before hitting the opposite wall. Throughout the event, Axel didn't even flinch. Everyone thought that Axel hadn't moved at all, and Draco had just missed, except Professor Alice and Draco Malfoy himself. If you look at his feet, you'd realize that he wasn't standing on the original spot that was marked in the ring. He was standing just a bit to the left. Hey look, he's not standing on the marked spot. Many among the students also only noticed it now as they began pointing it out to others. Malfoy glared at Axel. Lucky fluke, he muttered before launching another spell. Inflatus, inflates the target. This time, many people saw it. Even before Draco's spell was cast, they saw him languidly stepping to the side. Once again, the spell flew past him, missing him by a narrow margin. What? He moved even before the spell was cast. That was indeed the case. Axel was moving even before the spell was cast. It seems quite easy, right? But it was not that simple. Your opponent isn't blind. He can change his aim at the last second as well if he sees you moving. This time, when casting the spell, at the last moment, Draco suddenly slowed down his cast. It was expected that like all the times, Axel would move to the side this time as well. But contrary to his expectations, Axel just stood there unmoving as if he didn't intend to move in the first place. Draco thought that since his movements were so obvious, Axel must have easily noticed it when he slowed down his cast. So, you'll only move when you're certain that I'll cast, huh? He thought as he had another idea. This time, he didn't stop casting the spell. In fact, he cast it very quickly. But this time, he purposefully aimed a bit to the right. Now, when he moves, there'll be a 50% chance of the spell hitting him. But, contrary to his expectations, Axel didn't move at all. He just stood there, letting the spell miss him yet again. Meanwhile, the peanut gallery was enjoying the show. Axel noticed that many of them were holding up their magi mirrors, and the lights were flashing out of them. He didn't have a clue what the fuck they were doing. Professor Alice had dropped her playful attitude and was now looking at the duel with some interest. Everyone was thinking only one thing. Was it just a coincidence? Axel shook his head. You don't get it, do you? He asked Draco as he stepped forward. Flipendo. This time, Axel had once again moved to the side before the spell was cast. His movements weren't fast or hurried. He seemed to have just randomly stepped to the side while walking. Den Saojo, Case's grotesquely elongated teeth. He once again moved, and the spell missed. Flipendo. He had just leaned to the side. Spell after spell was fired from Malfoy's wand, and Axel was dodging them all, even before they were fired. All the while, he was calmly walking toward Draco, with his hands still in his pockets. Let me explain it to you, you dumbass, said Axel between his spells. I'm simply predicting the path of all of your spells based on your movements, from the direction your eyes are looking, to the direction your wand is point to the twitch of your every muscle. And moving out of the way at the moment when you can't change the direction anymore he explained simply. Anyone was welcome to try if they had the talent. He might be crippled and might not have much magical capability. 
But I'm still the master thief, you bastard. He was still the guy who'd honed his talent and skills for years. Some of his skills might have been disabled after that incident, but he still had many skills that were far more rare and valuable. Some of them were. His sharp eyesight that could read his target's every movement, his sharp mind that could predict all the possibilities and movements in a beat, and his insane reaction speed that enables him to act in an instant, as if he was moving out of pure instincts. Thus, as someone so much superior than this bug, his patience had finally waned after this boo, G's repeated attempts to annoy him. The peanut gallery went insane when they saw the unreal scene happening in front of them. It almost looked like Axel could see the future. The flashes of their magi mirrors intensified. Draco couldn't do anything and Axel was soon standing right in front of him. You need a good thrashing bug, Axel told him, even as the boy almost instinctively began backing up. Axel's one hand finally came out and it snatched Draco's wand right out of his hands. He noticed that Draco's wand seemed to pulse in his hand. It wasn't as strong as his wand, he could feel the wand eager to draw his magic. Hey, give it back, you filthy little. Axel ignored him as he focused on the wand. Loyalty by conquest. Said system helpfully. Interesting, he thought. Aleka Impulsa, he murmured. Crackle. Axel grinned. It wasn't as powerful as his wand, but the spell did work. Draco Malfoy was infuriated when his wand was snatched right out of his hand. It was almost similar to having your girlfriend stolen from you. Give it back, he yelled as he tried to seize it back. Zap. But instead, he got lightly electrocuted as soon as his hand touched his wands. Ouch! Axel nodded in satisfaction. This guy, he was already on his shit list from their very first interaction. He has always had a problem with this kind of person due to past reasons. The reason he was kicked out of the orphanage in the first place was because he had dared to defend himself against a rich second generation like this guy. Now, if this guy had any sign of human intelligence, he'd have learned his lesson after knowing his skills and won't mess with him anymore. Well, apparently not. You! Jerking his hand back in pain, Draco's anger reached its peak. You filthy mudblood! Give my wand back to me. My father. Shut up, ordered Axel in annoyance. Yep, they were the same. Do they think they can do anything just because they were lucky enough to be among the privileged? Electrica Impulsa. Crackle. Well, they didn't know that he was the same guy who didn't submit even when he was tortured inhumanely for ten minutes straight. But Draco didn't care. All he could see was his wand in the hands of this guy. Having never been punished his whole life, he simply didn't fear Axel. He tried to clutch Axel's throat as he yelled at the top of his lungs. You filthy mudblood! My father would he screeched but stopped was when his own wand was shoved inside his mouth. Notice, it was charged with two Electrica Impulsa spells. What? Damn! Whoa! There was a mixed reaction from the crowd. It was so out of the blue that even Professor Alice didn't expect it. She was just going to announce the end of the match. She wasn't worried about anyone getting injured, since all the spell could do was zap people. How was she to know that Axel would shove it in Draco's mouth? <coughs> a strangled sound of a pig being slaughtered came out from Draco as his whole body shuddered as if having a seizure. Magic suddenly surrounded both of them and separated them, taking the wand out of Draco's mouth. Courtesy of Professor Alice, but the damage had been done. Axel dusted his hands off while looking at Malfoy, who was lying pathetically on the ground, and there was a wet patch forming between his legs. That should keep your mouth shut for a while, he murmured. His only regret was that he should have charged it a few times more before plunging it in. Since his magic was too weak, the damage this boy suffered can't be called an injury. But he knew it was the best he could do considering the fact that Professor Alice would have stopped them as soon as it got even remotely dangerous. Um, Professor, would I get into trouble for this? Professor Alice, who had diagnosed Draco and found that this drama queen hadn't actually suffered any serious injury, gave Axel a helpless look. There's nothing serious. He's just shocked. So you won fair and square. At this moment, someone clapped and clapped. Soon the whole class was cheering for Axel. Axel looked at everyone in puzzlement. What the heck is with these people? Why are they making so much noise? 
though at that moment he was distracted by a system notification flashing in front of his eyes. Quest Progression Make friends, make allies, and make a good impression with the wizarding world. Rewards on every successive step you take towards building a reputation for yourself such that people willingly follow you one day. You've made a very deep impression on the people by showing your capabilities. Rewards, plus 3% approval, total 12%. Advice on how you can increase your magical output and learn other spells. Though apparently the system wasn't done yet. Congratulations! You have successfully reached the first milestone of the approval rate, thus enabling the Akashic Records to provide you with much more substantial help. Goof, congratulations! You have unlocked the class feature. You have unlocked your first class, Arcane Thief. You will be given techniques, magical spells, and missions to master this class and ascend to the next. With such a massive input of information in his head, Axel didn't know what to do. It was so much information that he decided to look through it after he's dealt with the current situation. Even though his actions might seem impulsive, as if he didn't care about the consequences, but he had done everything after careful calculations. And so, was the bug crushing satisfying? And the new system feature finally unlocked. The fun stuff begins now. Though now instant unreasonable power up. Read the upcoming chaps to know more about the new feature. Please keep giving me power stones. It's difficult to write such a high quality novel while also attending college. Next chapter title, The Arcane Thief. To read ahead and support this fic, come to Patreon, patreon.com slash snullygoster. Chapter 18, The Arcane Thief. Chapter 18. After sending Draco to the hospital wing, Professor Alice gave Axel a deep look. Axel Hunt, right? Axel nodded, wondering whether he was in trouble after all. Though, contrary to his expectation, Professor Alice had an impressed look as she actually smiled at him. The way you predicted the spell trajectories while moving in such a calm and composed manner when spells are being thrown at you, it was truly impressive. I don't think even a professional duelist could have done it better. You have a tremendous talent for this. Take ten points for Slytherin for an excellent demonstration of skills. It was the first time a student had received so much praise from Professor Longbottom. But Axel just sighed upon unwittingly gaining more points for the Slytherin. After that, Professor Alice took the safer approach for the rest of the class as she taught them some basic stuff about dueling. While she taught, Axel just blended himself among the students to hide from all kinds of gazes that were being thrown his way and to check out his rewards. Even though his actions might seem impulsive, as if he didn't care about the consequences, he had actually done everything after careful calculations. No one except the headmaster really has the power to expel him from here. Apparently, there used to be an option to have a seat in the Board of Governors by paying money. But now, money is the last thing Hogwarts needs. This he has known from the basic knowledge, and from what he's seen, the Malfoy family isn't really much of a big shot since it hasn't even got its own seat in the Wizengamot, so there shouldn't be any drastic actions. Now, the only other problem is... This attention, he thought, looking at many who were trying to find him among the crowd, especially Rose Potter. She was the one who start the applause for him. Now it's safe to assume that all this attention might cause some problems, but his eyes went to the system interface in front of him. A massive 3% increase in the approval rate and a suggestion on how he can increase his magic power output. Both of these rewards were so huge that he couldn't understand what exceptional work he did to deserve this. What could the impression of a few first years matter? But, whatever it was, he figured that it was totally worth it if he's got such insane benefits. The approval rate of each percent increases after he performs several impressive deeds or missions. After the first time when it got a massive 6% boost, it has only increased by one each time. But this time, he got 3% directly. As for the way to increase his magic power output, he realized which path he has to focus on to do that as the system directly gave the information into his brain. The main point is the connection with his wand. Right now, with so much nerve damage in his hands and body, his magic can't find the right pathways to flow out of his body into his wand. It causes pain when it can't escape, 
even if it doesn't affect the body directly. So, now imagine if the wand practically sucks out the magic. Now even if it couldn't find the way on its own, most of it can still be sucked out through various pathways, and that can be done by strengthening the connection with his wand. There's another benefit to this as well. The cherub hair core wand would amplify his magic based on the strength of his connection with it. So there are two are two way benefits in strengthening his bond with it. Though the question is how to do it. The system didn't specify that. Something to think about later. Now, for the final reward, the new feature. Honestly, Axel had never played any RPGs, so he had no knowledge of how this class system works. System Give me more info. You will have to activate the class feature for that. Do you accept the class Arcane Thief? Well, do I have any other class option? You do. But the class is so special that you can only accept them after you have passed the required threshold. Approval rate, which is too high. You will also get successive class options that come after gaining a certain degree of mastery in Arcane Thief or when you pass the requirements to possess a class. I can have multiple classes at once in the future, right? Affirmative. Then, yes, I accept the class, said Axel decisively. You are now an arcane thief. Now you can access the information you asked for. Arcane thief, a special class achievable only by those with exceptional skills and talent in thieving and possessing magic. There is nothing a master arcane thief can't steal. The fields of specialization include stealth magic, wards, traps, enchantment, pickpocketing, knife, short sword, wilding. Minor accomplishments in some other skills. Chance for major accomplishment in other fields through special missions or through special conditions. The method to learn these skills of these fields will be unlocked successively when you master the beginning skills and with missions. You might also get special missions for special skills. The methods will be imprinted directly into your mind. Well, I want to laugh right now, thought Axel, as he tried to suppress the wicked grin that was fighting its way into his face. This was every thief's wet dream. His hands had been itching after his last try at thieving, which had landed him in a hospital, and he had given up on stealing anything until he had enough skills to pull it off, which would take years. Now, it seems that he won't have to wait that long after all. It was lunchtime and Axel was making his way towards the Great Hall but he realized that there was a problem. Why is everyone looking at me? First years, he can understand, but the rest? No, sir. He should totally be a background character for others. He saw a group of students huddled together, watching something on their magi mirrors. Damn, can this guy see the future or read mind or something? He's just a first year, apparently. When one of them saw Axel passing by, he pointed at him. Hey, look, it's him, the guy in the RM. The others also looked at him and got surprised. This group was apparently more daring. Hey, can you take a picture with us? He asked, showing his magi mirror. Why? Asked Axel. He was genuinely confused. That made them somewhat confused. Well, why not? Your RM has gone viral on the Hogwarts forum. You're famous now. We have to be the first ones to share our pictures with you. What? Axel bailed out from there after making an excuse. System, what the fuck is going on? Host, the video of your fight, or the recorded memory as they call it, has been posted on the Magi Hive in Hogwarts Forum. It is currently being shared among various platforms, meaning that it is going viral. This has increased your reputation and thus helped you gain the system rewards. Fuck. Damn it. Shit. Hell. It made sense now. Only now he understood why he got such an outrageous reward of 3% approval for something so trivial as performing well in front of the first years. Right now, Axel hoped that the wizarding world was just as backward as it was ten years ago. For the rest of the day, Rose was left replaying the fight of Axel again and again. He did such a great job of teaching that arrogant Ponce a lesson, but unlike others, she was fully aware of his disabilities. He shouldn't be able to do magic, and his body was also not in a good state as far as she was aware. But still, he had managed to win the duel in such a domineering fashion. She noticed that he never made any rapid movements because he simply couldn't. And he could actually do magic. The last time she had seen, he could barely cast a Lumos while struggling. At that time, 
His determination to improve despite his disabilities had deeply moved her, and today he's progressed so fast. When he had won and Draco finally got what he deserved, she was so impressed that she had started to applaud. She would have wanted to praise him in person, but it seems that she can't do that anymore. He's a Slytherin after all. Even though her two aunts were Slytherins, Sirius had still never stopped on passionate hate for Slytherins, especially the greasy git. Those two might be the rare exceptions, or they just got their head right afterward, he'd say for her two aunts. Thus, it was understandable that Rose had gotten quite a lot of prejudiced opinions about the Slytherins. Thus, when Axel had gotten sorted into Slytherin, she had been quite disappointed that he actually turned out to be a Slytherin. She had begun wondering if Axel was an evil person or not. Plus, Neville and Susan hadn't heard better things from their home as well. And when she heard that her Aunt Bella was missing and Axel was the last person she had talked to, it was like her fears had come true. Thus, she had questioned him about what had happened. Though she had felt bad when Axel's eyes towards her had turned cold. She wasn't sure what was right anymore. Yesterday night, Aunt Andromeda had called her to ask about Axel, asking whether she was properly taking care of him or not. She had told Rose that Aunt Bella's reply did come and she said not to worry. Rose was quite ashamed and regretful while her aunt repeatedly stressed to take care of Axel. She thought she'll try talking to him today, but that guy didn't even acknowledge her presence today, even when she tried to catch his eye several times. It was like they were strangers. Rose was feeling quite vexed for some reason. No one had ever ignored her. Ouch! Why did you hit me? protested Neville. Rose blinked. She realized she had accidentally hit Neville. Why are you in the way? She asked rudely before getting up. Where are you going? He asked. Just to prank some Slytherins. She replied as she flicked her red hair off her face. Axel was strictly out of bounds. She'll have to prank other Slytherins. Neville sighed. She's back again, he thought in apprehension. This was Rose Potter's real nature, the one she hides behind her perfect, well-groomed persona. Anne, I have thought of several other classes as well, and one very special one, though it'll take years to completely master the classes, some screen time to the girl who lived, to show why Axel is needed to save the world in the first place. She's not mature yet, as she's only eleven, and she has led a pampered life. Not everyone can be like Axel, but she'll have character development as the years progress. Just keep giving Power Stones and the chapter will be here. To read ahead and support this novel, join Patreon. 135 subs already. Thanks for support. Patreon.com slash Snollygoster. Chapter 19. He's a Sigma fucking Magi Mirrors. Axel cursed under his breath as he walked towards the Great Hall after avoiding yet another group of curious students who were asking for a picture. This was not in his calculations. Most of the students seemed to have already seen his fight, and now many would inevitably try to research his background and shit. Many would even want to know if he's a pureblood or not. His footsteps paused in front of the Great Hall. What was more important, the food or the peace? His stomach gave him the answer. Food it is, he muttered before thinking how to go in. Right now, it would be for the best if he didn't appear in front of anyone. It seems like he'll have to use his skills, but they haven't been working well after his injuries, so there's still a chance that he'll be noticed. Taking deep breaths, he dipped his head low and diminished his presence as he looked around in all directions. Score, he thought, as he saw an opportunity. He began walking in the opposite direction to the Great Hall while keeping his head low. This time, very few people even noticed him, and even they didn't give him a second glance. He didn't know how he does this. He's just practiced a lot, and he started getting better after his various experiences. In the next few steps, when he passed by a group of students heading towards the Great Hall, he suddenly disappeared from sight, since he didn't emerge from the other side of the group he was passing by. He had blended into the group. After a few minutes, Axel soon emerged out of a group of students heading out of the Great Hall with a pile of food stacked in his backpack. He had stored a lot for emergencies like this one. He sighed. He was noticed several times just now. He wasn't sure if he'd be able to do it again with his body's condition being so bad. And also, damn, 
I didn't even perform any rapid movements, but why was my body hurting so much? He muttered. He couldn't understand why. Usually it's not that bad, only sometimes. At this moment, a system notification came, alerting him. Congratulations, you have unlocked the stealth skill, Blend. Allows you to blend in your surroundings using your body movements, accessories, and magic. Current proficiency, 10%. Information on how to gain further mastery will be transferred to your head. Congratulations, you have unlocked the stealth skill, Presence Reduction. Allows you to reduce your presence using your body movements and magic. Current proficiency, 15%. Information on how to gain further mastery will be transferred to your head. Congratulations, you have unlocked the thief skill, Daring Mind. A thief needs to be daring enough to attempt the theft. Allows you to calmly analyze your situation and make quick decisions not based on fear, but logic. Not a proficiency-based skill. Axel was left disoriented for a few moments when information was poured into his head. System, what the fuck? He uttered, politely asking for an explanation. The new class feature provides you the information to train physical, magical, and mental skills related to that class. Your class is Arcane Thief. When you sneaked into the Great Hall, you used these skills just now, meaning that you already possessed some mastery in them. So they were unlocked. The reason you were feeling pain was that you were using magic, and using magic naturally causes you pain. How can that be? thought Axel. I wasn't using magic, it was just my usual zone. The zone, as Axel calls it, is a state in which he is able to pull off difficult thefts with ease. Wait a moment, fuck. But then he suddenly realized, there's no way, right? Has he been using magic all this time? Now that he thought about it, it actually made sense. You have unknowingly incorporated magic in your skills after repeated training and practice over the years along with your talent. This is one of the reasons why you are as good as you are and were able to get a special class like Arcane Thief. It is a high-tier class, even above advanced classes. It cannot be randomly gained by anyone, especially not as their starting class in their crippled state. Axel slowly nodded in understanding. So that's why it hurts so much when he sneaks around late at night these days. It used to be so easy, Axel couldn't wait for the day his body is healed. When that time comes, he'll stop worrying about low-level people like bigoted purebloods. That will be the day he'll start his domination. The real threats would only be strong wizards and Voldemort and his minions. Going into an empty classroom, he ate his food in peace while he accessed the information that had been poured into his head. There were step-by-step -step instructions to train the skills he had unlocked, much like how the information on occlumency was poured into his head. But when he was getting immersed in it, the bell rang, signaling the end of the lunch. Sigh. Axel decided to do this after his classes were over. With his food problem solved, he only had to deal with his classmates who were easy enough to deal with. Today, they had herbology, history of magic, potion, and astronomy. The herbology was with the Hufflepuffs. The greenhouses of Hogwarts were huge. It was Axel's first time seeing magical flora, and of so many different varieties. He listened attentively when their squat professor with gray hair and muddy clothes, Pomona Sprout, told them about the magical properties of some of the plants to catch their attention. But he quickly lost interest when she had them do it practically, since he couldn't do anything with his hands. Need help? asked someone from the side. Axel glanced over to see Susan standing beside him, Hannah right behind her. No, said Axel simply as he focused back on his work. Susan pouted. Well, it does seem like you do, she said, looking pointedly at his handy work. The magical plant looked as crippled as his hands. Why do you want to help me? he asked. He didn't know why Susan would approach him while leaving her large group of friends. Susan was honest. I, I sort of feel bad that I thought you were a bad person when you were sorted into Slytherin. Axel didn't stop his work, not the least bit affected. And what makes you think I'm not a bad person? He asked, with all the bad person vibes coming out of him. Susan shook her head. Uh, I don't know. Because you were so cool today at the dueling? Because you shoved that snob's wand right into his face? Axel nodded in understanding. He had understood that he can't understand this girl. But he really liked her honesty. I appreciate your honesty. Would you prefer my honest reply or a dishonest one? 
Susan smiled. The honest reply. She chose instantly. Axel stopped his work for a second and gave her his full attention as he looked at her. I don't have any problem with you, but I'd prefer it if you left me alone. Susan's confident smile slowly disappeared upon listening to his reply. Oh, okay, then see you around, she said, trying to hide the sting that reply gave her. She really wanted to ask why he didn't want to be friends with her, or how could he not want to be friends with her. But she was now somewhat scared of his honest reply. Axel simply shook his head. He had nothing in common with that girl, and she was so superficial. It suddenly didn't matter if he was a bad person if he could duel well. They had nothing in common, and she was a bit too immature. Though it's not her fault since she's only acting her age. Very few eleven-year-olds would be mature enough that Axel would tolerate them. The next class was the History of Magic with Ravenclaws. So, you've already studied this one as well, huh? asked Axel as he glanced beside him. Daphne nodded her head with a sigh. Sadly, yes. That asshole made sure that I knew my pure-blood history, about how we fought goblins and stuff. She has decided to use that name for her father. And the fun part is, no one can stop her. She had once again chosen to sit in the last seat. Axel didn't hate her enough to move somewhere, else or deny her. She was much more tolerable. Daphne shook her head as she looked at him curiously. But forget about that. Tell me, how were you so good at the duel today? Who taught you? The streets, thought Axel. But he couldn't answer her with that, could he? Anyways, he had already started to pick up some of the skills even before he left the orphanage, since his life at the orphanage wasn't good either. Axel just shook his head mysteriously. It's a secret, he said. Daphne frowned. She knew her stuff. The things Axel was doing, even her dueling tutor couldn't do that. Daphne has always wanted to be powerful, thus she wanted to also learn how to do that. But the thing is, she doesn't know how to ask him to teach her. In her whole life, Daphne hasn't asked for anything, so she doesn't know how to. But then, she remembered something. Her sister Astoria had always had a way of getting whatever she wanted, and she always succeeded. Thus, even though it felt quite embarrassing, Daphne decided to try her sister's method. Hey, Axel. She pouted her lips as she blinked her eyes cutely. Will you teach me? She asked. Axel also smiled at her. Of course. I won't, he replied in kind, wondering why she would even think he'll agree. Daphne was left speechless for a moment before her face flushed red in embarrassment. Astoria, you hateful brat. To her relief, the professor came at this moment, preventing her from finding a hole to hide in. For history of magic, the professor was a middle-aged man with long hair, a beard, and a huge mustache. My name is Jakub Gorski, and I am your history of magic professor. I am a traveler and explorer who has decided to take a rest after a serious injury, he introduced himself in a deep and rugged voice. Now, before me, this subject was taught by the ghost of a professor who only taught about things that were centuries old and most of them pretty useless. Also, most of it was based only on Britain, he said in a somewhat condescending tone while shaking his head. No, we won't be doing that. We'd be studying only the history from which we can actually learn something. And we won't be sticking to Britain he spread his hands wide. I have traveled the world. I have visited numerous magical communities from the most primitive to the most developed. I have even visited many muggle places which had a connection to wizards. And let me assure you, this world is a wondrous place. Thus, along with some of magical Britain's history, you will be studying the history of other places as well. Of course, another reason would be that, since there are so many foreign students among you, that it doesn't make sense to force them to learn Britain's boring history. Daphne clicked her tongue from beside him. I shouldn't have sat in the last seat, she murmured in disappointment, her previous embarrassment forgotten. This is something I haven't ever been taught, Axel had to admit. This teacher was interesting, much better than a boring ghost professor who everyone would ghost but it was also a pity that he can't just do his other pending things instead, like he had thought he would, since he has to pay attention. First is occlumency. As much as he'd like it, he can't just focus only on occlumency. He really needs power right now, and occlumency is going to take time. The first stage, as System put it, isn't really that simple. 
For most of the wizards who have practiced occlumency, that is the final stage for them, and it takes them at least a decade to reach it for average wizards. That's why everyone isn't rushing to learn occlumency. Even with his talent, he can't master it instantly. And that can be fatal if he doesn't improve on other aspects during that time. His luck has always been shitty, and life keeps throwing obstacles at him from time to time. If he's only focuses on occlumency, he'll be weak as hell in this condition to face those obstacles. So now has several things on his plate at once. First, he has to learn occlumency. Then he has to unel, awk, and learn his arcane thief skills. And finally, he also has to increase his magical output by the method he received from the system. Sigma moves in chapter. It's not like he'll always stay a loner, but it'll take time to form connections. Just keep giving me power stones, and I'll keep writing and posting the best HP fanfic ever. To read ahead and support this novel, come to Patreon. Patreon.com slash Snollygoster. I'm writing the 29th chapter right now. Chapter 20. Mysteries and the Greasy Git. So, let's start with the important history of Britain, shall we? Said Professor Jakub Gorski, rubbing his hands together. In this lesson, we'll mainly be focusing on the important events that have happened in Britain along with their consequences. In my class, there's no need for learning precise dates, since I think those are the single most boring and useless thing that we can learn from history. Also, do remember to take notes. At the mention of notes, there was a hustling noise since there were many first years who hadn't bothered taking out their notebooks. Daphne glanced at Axel's hands when Professor Gorski mentioned taking notes. Can you write with that? She asked as she took out her notebook and fountain pen. Axel looked at her as if questioning why she was questioning the obvious. No, Daphne couldn't understand the situation. Then, how are you supposed to take notes and do homework and write exams? It would have occurred to her in the last class if Umbridge had actually taught them something worth writing. Axel actually didn't know it himself until yesterday. He didn't know anything about Hogwarts, and he didn't know why he had assumed that a magical school wouldn't stress on having you write stuff and just let you learn magic through wands. Thankfully, there was a solution. Professor McGonagall has allowed me to use self-writing pens. She said I'll get them soon. He had a signed slip from McGonagall to explain his situation. Daphne was surprised to hear that, Weren't they banned until the third year? These days, self-writing pens were so advanced and convenient that they had become a norm in the wizarding world. But it was banned at Hogwarts until the third year, since the students then wouldn't properly have practice in spelling and writing. It's quite easy to detect when something is written by one, so the younger students do struggle a lot writing everything with their own hands. Self-writing pens are banned for all years in the library, since you need to dictate in order to write, and no sound is allowed in the library. Otherwise, except for exams, the older year students are free to use them if their dictation isn't disturbing anyone, since it's fast and convenient, and they can spend more of their time practicing magic. Daphne sighed. How luck! She was about to say lucky, but she stopped herself. Having his hands in that condition, he's probably the last person to be called lucky. After everyone was ready, Professor Gorski began. Magical Britain is believed to be the origin of witchcraft and wizardry for many wizarding communities. Its history can be divided into three parts, primitive, early, middle, and recent. Let's begin with a brief description of each, shall we? The primitive age, we are directly going to skip. There are barely any factual records of that time, and there's nothing concrete. It doesn't come under studying history, it comes under researching history, have you ever wondered how wizards came into being? Where do wizards get their powers from? It's about that. Obviously not for the first years. Now, the real stuff in Britain started with Merlin. No one is really sure about his origins or how he gained his power despite there being multiple stories. But it has been widely accepted that Merlin was the most powerful sorcerer and the origin of most of the witchcraft and wizardry we have now. He had several apprentices at the time, each of whom he taught different fields of magic and even trusted some of them with his deeper secrets, like how he gained his power. These apprentices then branched out to many places, spreading what they had been taught and researching their own magic as well. 
This was how a lot of different magical communities were formed in different countries, with Britain being the most powerful and progressive. One of these apprentices, the one with whom Merlin had shared the secret to his powers, actually turned on him. Her name was Morgan Le Fay, more popularly known as Morgana. We'll study in detail about it later. Also, the founders of Hogwarts were also in this age. He took a pause here, seeing that many were struggling to keep up. Axel was fascinated. He wondered where Merlin got his powers from. The information is currently locked at your level. Damn! Must be a hell of information to be locked even after 13% approval. Professor Gorski continued. This was the most important stage, so even while giving a brief description, I had to say so much. Now, the third stage is the medieval stage. This lasted the longest. It was after every one of these powerful people had either disappeared or died. This is the stage of degradation. Many families started to hoard their magic, and conflicts continued to grow between them, causing the loss of a lot of valuable magical knowledge. A great many dark lords emerged as well. During this age, Britain didn't make any significant improvement in magic, and instead went backward. Then comes the period that historians called the Recent Age. It's called such because it started just about a decade ago. Yes, Britain was in its medieval age until a decade ago. It's after the demise of the most recent Dark Lord. This is a period of rapid progression. Britain already had the foundation and funds befitting of the origin of many countries' witchcraft and wizardry. Under the phenomenal leadership of Minister Bellatrix Black, it is rapidly gaining back its lost status and reforming to be a powerful and prosperous magical country with at a rate never seen in any other magical country or community, finished Gorski. So, this was a brief description of the history of magical Britain. Now we'll go into detail starting from the early age. And so, the history class went on. After history, they had potions with Gryffindors. Why exactly are you here? Axel asked Rose, who was standing beside him in front of his potion-making counter. It would be a lie to say that he wasn't annoyed with her presence. Though, if anything, Rose seemed even more annoyed at being by his side than he. She looked at her magi mirror in grievance. It had several messages from Anne Andromeda, all but ordering her to take good care of Axel and babysit him. She even threatened to send a howler if she didn't. It's not like I want to be here. I simply don't have a choice, she said in a peeved tone. She looked at Axel with narrowed eyes. What exactly did you do to Aunt Andromeda? She's been awfully concerned with your well-being. Axel frowned. Must be that woman who asked her to sit here. He had mixed opinions about this woman. Her actions don't make sense, and they're contradictory if he takes Bellatrix's words into consideration. Her letter to McGonagall did help him in the end, since he now had her signed note stating his injuries, and she did get him to have a good time, and now she's asking Rose to take care of him. Axel didn't know if she wanted something else from him. But, does it really matter? He thought to himself. He realized that he couldn't really bring himself to care. Whether it was some kind of compensation due to the memory extraction, or whether she wanted something else from him, he didn't really care anymore. The situation is, he has to partner up with Rose for this class. It can't be that bad, can it? Does he really need to struggle so much to reject it? Rose was even more annoyed when her question was ignored. So, did you do anything to her? She's even threatening to send a howler if I didn't help you. At that moment, a man strode in, with his cloak billowing behind him in style. The first thing he did was a roll call. When Rose's turn came, Rose Potter, present, sir. Snape looked up from his sheet at Rose. Even though his face was expressionless, Axel could tell that something was different from his experience in reading people. Snape's eyes then fell on him for a second before going back to the parchment. When his turn came, Snape had looked up at him again, and Axel didn't know why, but he had a bad feeling about this. Just great, he muttered in annoyance. After roll call, the man swept his gaze around at the class. You are here to learn the subtle science and exact art of potion-making, he began. He spoke in barely more than a whisper, but they caught every word. As there is little foolish wand-waving here, many of you will hardly believe this is magic. I don't expect you will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of... 
Axel glossed over the rest. The man seemed to be exaggerating quite a bit. He'll have to see if this man can really teach them to brew glory and stop her death. But suddenly, Hunt, what would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? What the fuck? Of course, Axel didn't know. Potions aren't going to help him when he's in a fight. And, with his condition, can he even brew potions? Thus he hadn't bothered even touching the book. I don't know, Professor, he said simply. He didn't think it was a big deal. He could bet even half the students didn't know anything based on what he's seen from his previous classes. But Snape's lips curled into a slight sneer. Tut, tut, you should be more qualified before trying to leech off someone's fame, he said, glancing at the person beside him. For a moment, the Slytherins and Gryffindors seemed to unite, as many of them had problems with the girl who lived and the adopted daughter of the most powerful pureblood family partnering up with him. Many of them snickered, sneered, or smirked at Snape's comment. Though Axel was surprised, he didn't know so many people minded. He was just minding his own business. It seems he had underestimated her fame. If he knew, he'd have kicked Rose out ages ago. He was also surprised why Snape would target a Slytherin. From what he had heard and observed, he was a discriminatory bastard who always favors Slytherins. Let's try again. Where would you look if I told you to find me a Bezoar? Axel had had enough. It was clear that this bastard was targeting him. Tell me, system. Rose was a bit worried. Sirius had warned her repeatedly about the greasy git. That he might be a pedophile and necrophile, whatever those things meant, and that she should be careful of him all the time. When Snape had asked the second question, she was going to help Axel by whispering the answer to him, but... A bazaar is found in the stomach of a goat. It's a very potent antidote that can save you from most poisons, said Axel, surprising her. Snape sneered. Well, a lucky question. Then tell me, Hunt, what is the difference between Monkshood and Wolfsbane? Not a second after he had asked the question, Axel's bored voice came again. They're the same plants. There's yet another name for this plant as well. It's Aconite. Snape seemed to not give up. What color of fumes are released when a boil potion is made successfully? Pink. The potion in question is an effective remedy against pustules, hives, boils, and many other scrofulous conditions. Snape was still not satisfied. What is the Wigginweld potion? Rose frowned. This was not even a first-year question. Even she didn't know the answer. But Axel didn't even bat an eye as he answered. It's a healing potion with the power to cure injuries. It is also the antidote to the sleeping draught and the draught of living death, which, by the way, is actually the answer to your very first question. That managed to shut him up and slap those who had laughed. Snape looked at him for several seconds before looking at the rest of the class. Well, why aren't you all writing that down? Axel had managed to answer all the questions. Rose was impressed and confused at the same time. Why didn't you answer the first question earlier? Axel shrugged. I was trying to keep a low profile. Not everyone has a powerful background to fall upon like you. She was a bit speechless to hear that. Low profile? He was probably the most high profile first year right now after her. Though looking back, he did try his best. He nen ever sought any fame. But he'd be bullied more if just he let bullies like Snape and Malfoy walk all over him. So when there was no other choice but to stand out, he stood out in a way no one would dare to mess with him again, if they were not idiots. When thinking about it, she could understand why. Slytherin is infested with purebloods like Malfoy, so he understand why he would want to keep a low profile. Axel raised his index finger. Also, let me make clear, I am not sitting with you in the next class. No matter what. I was an idiot to even think this could work out fine, am I clear? By now, even Rose knew better than to mess with this guy. She was so overwhelmed by his rhythm that she found herself nodding obediently. If anyone who knew her saw this, they'd have their jaws dropped so low that you'll have to dig them out. Snape had them brew a potion for the rest of the class. Axel and Rose's potion was progressing just fine since Axel was doing almost nothing. But of course, someone had to have a problem. Hunt, why aren't you doing anything? Axel produced two pieces of paper from his pocket. One was his condition report he had got from St. Mungo, signed by Andromeda, which mentioned his current body's condition 
and another was McGonagall's signed note on the state that he be given some liberties on things which he can't do. Axel had thought that this should shut him up, since everyone was always just too surprised to know just how bad his body actually was. But apparently, not Snape. Axel knew that the man was indeed surprised to know about his condition, but he didn't seem to show the same empathy as the other teachers. Well, I don't see the problem here, he said after a pause. Huh? This made both Axel and Rose surprised. Pardon? Snape sneered. I said, I don't see the problem here. Having injuries doesn't give you the excuse to not try. If you're afraid of bringing your partner down, then don't pair up in the first place, he said clearly. Well, wouldn't be a problem if doesn't fucking hurt every time I try, you bastard, thought Axel. He knew this bastard knew it was painful, and yet he was making him do this. Fine, if this is how you want to play it, thought Axel as he picked up his things and left Rose's table. It was good that this bastard knew how bad and irreparable his condition was. He'll get a nasty surprise when he one day finds out just how much Axel can do even with this condition, and an even nastier one when Axel eventually heals himself and becomes more powerful than a wizard and a better potioner than this guy. Axel can hold grudges for years until he finally pays them back. The potions class wasn't too difficult in the end, since he didn't do anything that'll be difficult with his condition. Axel will simply get a bad grade. But since when was that a problem? Funnily enough, the greasy bat had stopped targeting him after he had left Rose's table. This made him hate her more. Damn it, if only he had known that she was the problem. He'll make sure this won't happen again. But with the classes over for the day, he can now focus on better things like increasing his power output and exploring the new system feature. All right, system, explain how I should level up this arcane thief class and unlock better skills, he said to the system after he had retreated to his hideout that night. First things first, like last time with the spell practicing, he once again focused on escape first. Arcane thief might not sound powerful, but as a thief, Axel can see its huge potential. Alongside ensuring his safety, it can be very powerful in combat. In fact, an unusually skilled thief by profession already, he'd be able to use these skills to their fullest potential. Like how he did at that time with Valentino Girl. Despite all her so-called talent and genius, hadn't Axel caught her off guard at that time without any power? If she was a certified enemy, she might have been dead right then and there. Also, he had almost given up on thieving after his last attempt. But now, with Thin, he skills of the Arcane Thief class. The purebloods wouldn't know what hit them. Those who skimmed through some details on the history don't need to worry too much. The long-ass history lesson was a one-time thing for some world-building and to raise some valid mysteries which would be explored later. Like how wizards came into existence, how did Merlin got his powers? If Merlin was the reason for witchcraft and wizardry in most many countries, how did other countries which are not included get their own magical practices? In the next chapter, he finally starts to train his skills. Please vote this fic with Power Stones so that I can be motivated to write even in my busy schedule. Come read ahead and support this fic at Patreon, patreon.com slash snollygoster. Edit, geez, he'll be healed soon enough. Have some patience, guys, it'll be more worthwhile.